And if Haley loses by even close to that much, she would make history. The biggest loss for a primary candidate in their home state in recent memory. And that brings us to our big questions with our team of correspondents fanned out across the state and around the country. How many primary voters are turning out? How big is the margin of victory? And the key to tonight, what will Nikki Haley do next? We've got our team of political pros standing by, but I want to start with some of the early signals that we're getting with Chuck Todd, who's been digging into those exit polls. And one of the biggest questions, Chuck, who is actually showing up to vote in this primary today? Well, look, we were the biggest thing, of course, we were looking for is, would you see some non-traditional voters, right? Would this electorate look more like New Hampshire's electorate, or would it look more like Iowa's electorate? And going into tonight, the bet, the smart bet, was always that it would look more like Iowa's electorate. Exactly, but even though the rules gave an up, gave the opportunity for the Haley campaign to get independents in there, yeah. and if Democrats did not vote in the South Carolina primary three weeks ago, they could, in theory, come in here. But so far, everything we've seen about this electorate looks a lot more like Iowa. Number one, it is more male. This 53% of the electorate being male, it's never been that high. The last three South Carolina Republican primaries, all were 51% male. We've noticed this since the Dobbs decision. Mm. Fewer women identify as Republican. And I think this is something that we should continue to be tracking as we go along. And of and course, reproductive rights, just to say, on a lot of people's minds right now, given absolutely. what has happened with that controversial ruling in Alabama that said an embryo should be considered a child. A hundred percent. Now let's go to education. We've okay. always talked about this, college-educated Republicans versus the non-college-educated. This split, this is very much a Trump electorate, 57% of voters so far did not have a college degree. You know what this number was though? Uh, eight years ago, it was 54. So this has dramatically gone down. Eight years a whole, the last competitive, uh, the last competitive primary had a majority of the Republican primary voters were college educated voters. But again, I go back to, we have seen the Republican party change. It is a different party, it has fewer women in it. And the women that have left the party, college educated. Hmm. So this is making a lot of sense. Let me go with party identification. What did Nikki Haley need to do well tonight? A lot more of this she stuff. This slice of the exactly. That's right. That's See right. this? All of this total, 31% not identifying as a Republican. The good news for her is that this is more than it was eight years ago. This number is a collective yeah. number. But that number, 4% versus 2%, yeah. no. This needed to be double digits. New Hampshire, she had an electorate that was much more competitive. It does not look like she's got that competitive this time at all. And then let me show you one more on sure. ideology. This is this very conservative. Now, as you know, the very definition of the word conservative is changed in the Trump era. But Trump voters believe if you support Trump, then you must identify yourself as very conservative. We saw this phenomenon in Iowa. It was the, before this year, most Republicans picked somewhat conservative. Hmm. When you would ask, because it's a four-part question. Right. You can just show very conservative, somewhat conservative, not very, and then moderate, and then liberal, and you know, very liberal. And for, for my entire professional career, exit polls, the Republican plurality has always been somewhat conservative. Until now. Till now. Very conservative number is now the top number, and this wow. is also the highest it's ever been. But this usually translates into Trump supporters. That means you support Trumpism. So I was just going to say, pulling back big picture, if you're looking at this from the macro perspective, yes. reading the tea leaves, because obviously we don't have vote count in yet, right? We don't know what's happening. But this seems more favorable to Donald Trump than Nikki Haley. And... We know this is a phenomenon. Most, most of the time, the uh, Trump's uh, number in these exit polls usually improves over what we see in the first, first round of exits. And part of that is simply those most enthusiastic about telling exit pollsters who they're voting for are usually the folks that are anti-Trump. So this, this electorate could even be more Trumpy than I'm, we see. I'm going to ask you to work with our team, to work with Ed, who's in the back here. I'm pulling together some more numbers because I want to put some faces behind the data here. That's obviously so important. We're going to talk about this, pros. You stand by. But I want to come over here to our Jacob Soboroff, who has been out at polling locations all day long. And Jacob, obviously one of the big questions here is turnout, of course. You just heard Chuck talk about who actually seemed to show up today. How does that sync with what you're seeing on the ground? Uh, there are certainly turn and Hallie, forgive me, but I got to talk in my golf broadcaster voice because <laughs> you know the rules and regulations are a little oh, different yes. in South Carolina. They don't necessarily let folks like us into polling places, but here at Sugar Creek, the folks have been very accommodating and have let us inside. 
turnout's historically high here, and it's high again today. Come with me. I'm going to show you. First, I'm going to show you a little sweet. Then I'm going to get to the substance. This is Grace. She's taken the ballots from everybody. What Grace is, Grace doesn't like to be on camera, but she's made some scotch for everybody that participates in the process here. She says they're delicious. We'll be sampling them in a minute. Uh, I want to show you the turnout numbers, though. And uh, I'm going to leave everybody here to do their thing. We don't want to talk politics with anybody. We don't want to interfere with the process. Um, but the team that's doing the election here has been very, very accommodating. I said it before. This is Mary Lee. This is Alice, who's running the, the show here as the clerk. Um, can we talk about the turnout? We talked earlier about the turnout has been historically high here. Um, is it holding up? Yes. When you say yes, I saw back in 2016, the last uh, contested Republican primary here, about a thousand people had participated. It was about 45 percent turnout. What is it looking like? I, I know you got all the numbers and the facts on the on the machine. What is it telling us now? It's at 36 percent. We have an hour left. So with an hour left, how many people have voted here today? 828. 828. Well, another one of the folks that's working here, Hallie, told me that uh, uh, only double digits uh, people had turned out about, what did you say, 3940 for the, for, the, for the Democratic primary. So obviously uncontested on that side, but significantly higher turnout. And one thing I want to make really clear, we can't tell if these folks are Democrat or Republican because this is a primary where regardless of your affiliation, you can show up if you haven't participated in the Democratic side, correct? Yes, you can vote in either primary, only one. Okay, thank you very much, Mary Lee. I really appreciate it. Alice, keep up the good work here. Um, I think, uh, Hallie, let me just quickly pop open the door, see if any voters are coming in, because right now it is a quiet moment. Still a quiet moment outside, so we'll uh, we'll keep tabs on the situation here. Turnout is high, um, but we won't know until uh, all the ballots are cast and counted That's who right. actually showed up, obviously, uh, and who for. Well, you clearly have a future, Jacob, working for the Golf Channel. You've also done a lot of political coverage for us here at NBC News. <laughs> I you. wonder how this compares. I've watched you at the polling places in Iowa, uh, excuse me, the caucus sites in Iowa, the polling locations in New Hampshire. Give us a sense of how this compares now as we hit this, this critical primary and look ahead to Super Tuesday on March 5th. Well, let's let's talk politics. But in order to do that, I actually I really do literally need to go outside. Guys, okay. let's step outside just for one second because the rules are strict, and I want to I want to be careful here not to make anybody uncomfortable. Um, Obviously, in Iowa and New Hampshire, sort of they were setting the stage. And, and I think that people were there uh, to try to create momentum for, for some of these candidates. Here in South Carolina, Nikki Haley is a known quantity. Momentum is not the conversation. It's do they support her over Donald Trump? Is Donald Trump turning people off enough here that people will go uh, with their former governor and our former U.N. ambassador, uh, Nikki Haley? And what I've heard from people at this polling place and throughout Greenville, the, as you said, the most populous county uh, in the state is that Donald Trump, just like the polling in indicates is still the preference of the majority of people, and this is all anecdotal, um, that I have talked to. Uh, each of these systems are different. The way people participate uh, is different in each of them, um, but the common thread is here. People are not afraid to talk about Donald Trump, not afraid to talk about their support for Donald Trump, and the people who have felt like they're going to challenge him, and in this case, the lone holdout is Nikki Haley, uh, don't seem to have the support uh, of these primary election goers, Hallie. Jacob Soboroff. Uh, Sobo, thank you so much. I know you're heading to a watch party later on tonight. We're going to check back in with you. A bunch of times throughout the evening. We are also going to be taking a look at obviously these watch parties we've talked about where these supporters of both of these candidates, former President Trump, of course, and former Governor Nikki Haley are showing up ready for the speeches, whatever those speeches will be later on tonight. Once polls do close, once we get a better sense of the numbers, you can see some of them in the walls here. And I'm looking, I see Garrett Hake up here in RS21. I'm going to ask uh, our director, Brett, to pull it up full. Garrett, give us a sense of the vibe check where you are at the Trump watch party. Well, Hallie, they opened the doors here about two hours ago for people to start showing up at this watch party. I've been at all the Trump big watch parties so far. This will be the largest of them so far. It's starting to fill in now. You've got a mix of run-of-the-mill supporters, younger people. We're very close to the University of South Carolina campus, major donors and the like, big supporters from all over the state. What we've seen from Trump in general as he's been in South Carolina is a little bit of a focus on the primary, but also started to test things for the general election, started to test different messages and started to try to appeal to different audiences. A lot of attention was paid last night, for example, to the fact that he attended a gala for black conservatives here in Columbia. And there was a lot of news made at that event. And I'm fortunate enough to be joined by someone who was at that event, Tracy Phillips, who I've interviewed before as a Trump supporter 
reporter. You were at that event, and I want to ask you about the reaction to that event, because there's been so much of it, specifically the comments that the former president made comparing his indictments, basically saying that has made him popular, more popular in the black community, and that, and that you know, his connection to the black community sort of suggests through his mugshot and through his, his experience in the criminal justice system. Yeah. A lot of people, especially the Biden campaign, thought those comments were racist. You were in the room. Yes. What did you think? I was in the room, and I was about 100 feet from where he was speaking, and I thought it was funny because it, he was not wrong. He was right. I mean, anybody who, all of us in the black community know that historically that the justice system has not been in our favor. Um, Biden's own crime bill, that he, it's, it's ironic that Biden would call it racist, considering he authored the crime bill that started this domino this a effect. Huge thing in the 2020 <laughs> exactly. primary for him, and, coming back up now. And he actually recently, if I'm not mistaken, said he was proud of, of that bill. So I think the irony of Biden saying that a, a, a joke, really, that Trump made that we all thought was funny um, was racist is it, it's hypocritical. This, this is like the oldest Donald Trump story to me of all time, because the question is always how seriously you take him, how literally you take him. When is he joking and when is he being offensive? And to joke to you in the room, I feel like, that, you know, a lot, there was a lot of reaction around the country saying, ah, here it is, the same old Donald Trump. How do you, as a Trump supporter, bridge that gap. How does he make that connection to do better with black voters than he's done in the past? But honestly, it depends on how you, if you understand, I mean, comedy is, is dark. Comedy is offensive. I mean, you can ask any comedian in America, in the world, is that if you have to risk offending people in order to help people think, I'm taking that as a quote from Dr. Jordan Peterson. However, it's true with comedy. Comedy can be offensive, but it's also funny because sometimes things that are funny can also be offensive to others, but it's not something that, it's still comedy. In 2016, African-American voters were not a player in the Republican side of the primary here. It thinks like 1% of the electorate on the Republican side were black voters. Are we to see more black voters show up for Donald Trump tonight than we've seen in the past? Is, are we seeing a change in the Republican Party? I think you're already seeing it, aren't you? Well, I don't know. I mean, the we'll percentages see what, are this showing. This is the first state yeah. where, it'll, you know, there is a significant percentage of black voters for even him to try to appeal to. Well, the thing about it is he doesn't have to try to appeal to black voters. He is already appealing to black voters. He's appealing to black voters because we're sick and tired of the games that the Democratic Party has been playing with us for centuries, for decades. And, you know, you, we're waking up and we're recognizing, you know what, I did better under Trump. And Trump is a real person and he cares about us. And I think that's what appeals to people. We just want someone who really cares. When you spoke before, you talked about this idea that Trump have, is functionally an incumbent in this race. You don't have to guess what he's going to do. I, I've been doing this a long time. African-American voters I've talked to in the past, in the last race, tend to be very pragmatic voters. It's not about theory. It's about policy. Exactly. How much does that make a difference in this race now that you're not saying, as Joe Biden likes to say, between the almighty and the alternative, you, you, you know what the alternative exactly. is. Talk to me. Talk me through that a little bit. I think that if we have four more years of what we've had in the last three years, our country will be lost. But and I think black voters see that. So they know that under the Trump administration, yes, there was a lot of social issues. However, we were doing great as that's a people. A, that's a trade-off you're that's willing to make. That's the trade-off we're willing to. I don't care about the social stuff. I just want to make sure that I can support myself. I can send my child. My son bought a home at a 2% interest rate during Trump's part, during Trump. I bought my fourth home at that point. Mm. Neither one of us can afford to sell our homes right now I, I, I've because been of in, the interest I, rates. I, I just it, bought a house. Believe me, I feel exactly. that. Hey, Tracy, I gotta, I'm going to leave it there for a all second right, here. I could you. do this all night, but exactly. alas, we're going to throw it back to Hallie uh, in you, D.C. Hallie. You, you may be doing some of that all night, Garrett. I think what's so interesting about the conversation you just had and about generally where you are is we know that while there may be such thing as a tepid Donald Trump supporter, the vast majority are intensely loyal Donald Trump supporters. And I look at the room behind you and I look yeah. at the folks that you're talking to and that you've been talking to throughout the day since this watch party has, has begun. These are the folks who will show up who will make the drive, who will come and stand in line and go through security and be in this room waiting for their moment to see the former president speak. 
Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Hallie. And look, this is part of the difference with Donald Trump and with any other candidate, frankly, I've covered in my career. Donald Trump, at least in the context of a Republican primary, is a movement. He's a star. I mean, yes, he's a politician, but that's not the point. People feel like they are a part of something when they attend his rallies and when they come to these events. And frankly, even when they're asked to defend things he says that might be offensive to other people, they're on the team. And there's a sense of connection that exists there. That's been really important to him in a Republican primary. In a general election, the context is different because then those shy Trump voters start to matter a lot more. Those tend to be the voters who may not want to have to go defend everything Donald Trump says at a dinner party or at their kids' soccer practice. But maybe they do feel like his policies were better for them in some way. And so that dynamic is going to change substantially mm -hmm. here over the next couple of months. And it'll be very interesting to see how much the folks you described and the folks who are part of that movement, the folks who are going to be at events like this, can buoy him and how much he, you know, what the universe of people is in that shy Trump voter yep. quotient that's still out there that he can bring back into the fold. A billion dollars is going to be spent to influence that decision between now and November. Garrett Hayden, glad to have that conversation with you. I know you're going to stay posted up there at the watch party for former President Trump. Thank you. There are also perhaps not shy supporters of Nikki Haley at her watch party. It's where we find our correspondent, Ali Vitale. You see her up there. She's standing in the hallway. Ali, I see you in our RS-22 screen. Talk us through what you're seeing, because the key piece to remember here, right, Nikki Haley, she was the governor here. And this is not a state that is unfamiliar to her. This is quite literally her home turf. Correct. Walk us through it. Exactly. It's her home turf. And voters here remember that. I'll bring you inside the room and then I'm going to bring you to the person who you want to talk to right before election night, which is the person running the Haley campaign. So let me take you inside the room here. We don't yet have folks, actual supporters in here. Doors don't open for them yet, but they're going to have the requisite snacks. They're going to have the cash bar when they actually get in here. But most importantly, our, the campaign manager for the Nikki Haley team is here with us, Betsy Ankeny. It's rare that we get you on camera, so I'm feeling really good about that. <laughs> You, nice to see you too. Talk to us a little bit about, we know the stakes here in South Carolina. Frankly, it's rare to have a campaign not try to argue with me about whether or not they're going to win, but instead argue about the margins. Talk to me about your expectations for tonight. Well, you hit the key word, the stakes. We know the odds, but we also know the stakes. We understand that this is about saving our country. We understand that Nikki Haley is the only one who can win a general election and finally get us back on track. Donald Trump lost in 2020. He lost in 2022. He lost us the House in 2018. Nikki Haley is the only one who can finally get us back on track. And so those are the stakes of this race, and that's what we're focused on. And you've worked on a lot of down-ballot races. So you know the impact of what it is to have a presidential at the top of the ticket. I see why you're making that argument. I think the other thing I think about often is what Nikki Haley said to me in our interview earlier this week, as well as just this morning after she voted, she said, we haven't thought past Super Tuesday. I know you probably have, though. Maybe she hasn't, but you probably have. What happens past Super Tuesday? Well, I think it's a good point. We are going to Michigan tomorrow. We will see you in Michigan tomorrow night. We have over 12 stops through Super Tuesday, and we have leadership teams already built out in those states through the end of March, including Georgia, Washington State, Illinois, Ohio. So there's a lot of fertile ground for us, and we are just focused on the fight ahead and taking this one step at a time. Fight for every inch is our motto. I think the thing that we get hung up on, and I think probably rightly so, is the delegate math. In a state like South Carolina, for example, it's a winner-take-all primary. What's the delegate strategy in those states, even if they're fertile ground for Haley to build a coalition, some of them are winner-take-all. Again, let's see what happens here tonight. There are a lot of those states that are winner-take-all. There's also a lot of proportional states. We will keep fighting for every inch. We will keep moving forward. We're going to be at 12 stops over the next week, so we're looking forward to it. Betsy, thank you for talking to us. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the results tonight. <laughs> uh, Hallie, I'm going to send it back to you, but again, I do think it's really important for us, and this is something Betsy has said to me in the past. They know the odds, but they also know the stakes of this election. So that's it, Allie. I'm going to ask you to stand by for a little bit throughout the night, uh, throughout the next hour, if you will, really the next 40 minutes. I want to show folks here. Polls closed just 40 minutes from now. Voters are out voting. You saw one of those locations with our own Jacob Soberoff not too long ago. We've got our Meet the Press moderator, Kristen Welker, standing by, who's been listening into this conversation with us. And Kristen, it's interesting to hear, and you've talked to Nikki Haley. We just heard that conversation between Allie and Haley's campaign manager, where she's talking about places like Washington State. She's looking ahead, giving every indication that tonight, whenever Nikki Haley does give her speech, whatever the results are, She's probably not going to be saying the words, I'm out of the race. 
I don't anticipate that we're going to hear that from her, Hallie. I've been talking to her campaign aides and they say, look, Michigan is a state obviously where voters can vote in a party in which they're not registered heading into Super Tuesday. 11 of those states are open or semi-open primaries, which means that there can be crossover votes, which means that independent voters, Democrats, who you were talking about with Chuck, those voters with whom Nikki Haley usually does well can potentially vote for her. But Hallie, let's just zoom out here. Look, I interviewed her several weeks ago and I asked her, what does success look like in South Carolina? And she said she needs to beat what she did in New Hampshire. She lost by about 11 points in New Hampshire. Polls show her trailing former President Trump by as much as 30 points heading into tonight, Hallie. So that's going to be the challenge. Her aides say if she can beat those expectations, that's what a good night looks like. But Haley's moved her own goalposts, Hallie. She has said, look, she's in it no matter mm -hmm. what. She's kind of left aside that language about needing to exceed what she did in New Hampshire. And here's where it gets challenging for Nikki Haley, even if she can pick off a state or two. If she does get trounced tonight in South Carolina, the calls could grow louder for her to get out of this race. I had a chance to sit down with California's governor, Gavin Newsom, a Democrat. I asked him about Haley staying in the race. How does he see this as a Democrat? Take a look at that. I don't know why Democrats would want her out of the race. She's one of our better surrogates. I mean, she's defining the opposition to Trump incredibly effectively. I mean, she's making points I'm applauding every single day about his temperament, his capacity, uh, his, you know, unraveling in real time. So, again, Hallie, I just underscore that point that you were just discussing with Allie, which is that this is her home state. Hmm. She's never lost an election in this state where she served as governor. So even if she beats expectations, even if she does better than the polls show her doing, if she loses tonight, that is still a stinging defeat in her home state. Her aides say they are looking at counties like Charleston, York, and Greenville, larger population centers, more suburban population centers, to see how she might be doing. So we'll be watching those very closely. But again, incredibly high stakes for the former governor of that state. But look, they are defiant, Hallie. Yeah. I did a gut check with one of her top aides and said, is there any way that she gets out in the wake of tonight? And they said, no, they believe the voters have a right to weigh in. And this primary is still underway and we haven't gotten to Super Tuesday. What's also interesting, Kristen, you call it a potentially stinging defeat for Nikki Haley, even if she does beat where the expectations are. It could also potentially be a defeat that may make history. When you look at candidates in a Republican primary losing their home state, I think back to 2016 when Marco Rubio, then of course Senator of Florida, lost his home state to yeah. then candidate Donald Trump. Absolutely. And, and Hallie, if that were to happen, it's a question of momentum. And you mm. and I always talk about the two M's, the math and the momentum, right? Because if she loses in South Carolina, she would be behind even more when it comes to the delegate count. But she wouldn't have that boost of momentum. That's what she's looking for here. She's looking for bragging rights yeah. to be able to say, look, Look at all the polls. Look at what they showed. I exceeded the polling. Sure, I may have lost, but I did better than those polls said that I was going to do. And if she's deprived of the ability to say that, Hallie, then she doesn't have the type of momentum that she's looking for, that she's hoping for, that quite frankly, she needs heading into Michigan. So that's going to be, I think, the big question. But again, they are looking towards Michigan. That is a state where independent voters can vote for her, where she could potentially stand a chance of having a stronger show showing against former President Trump, who at this point in time has just been such a dominant frontrunner in the face of four indictments, in the face of skipping all of the primary debates, Hallie. As, as you know, as you and I have discussed, all of that has only emboldened him throughout this process. Hallie. Well, let me tell you what, Ms. Welker, you are going to have no shortage of things to talk about tomorrow morning on Meet the Press. <laughs> We're going to be excited to watch you, to watch your guests, to watch your panel tomorrow. Meet the Press with Kristen Welker, Thank Sundays you. on NBC. Okay, so Kristen talked about the momentum and she talked about the math. She hit the momentum, but let's talk about the math, Chuck Todd. Let's talk about specifically the delegate math, because yep. that's what matters here. Look, we're on our third state, right? There haven't been many delegates, right? In fact, this is the state we're offering up the most delegates in one night yep. with 50 delegates, right? But as you can see, now everything starts to ramp up, right? Tuesday, we have Michigan, and you can see here, and we get folks, I'm going to 
swap sides with you over <laughs> here. So you can see this map here. As you can see, we'll go into yellow, right? And we have all these caucus states. That's right. The caucus states are not good for, for Nikki Haley. Caucus states are party run, and this is Trump's party. So caucuses, he's going to overperform in. It, it goes to that issue of loyalty from the former well, president. Well, who's running more the likely party. To show up. Exactly. Yeah. But let's go to where, where all this is likely yeah. to come to a head. Here's your Super Tuesday map. Okay, so let me go back over here a little bit and, and see. Other than up here, okay, Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont. Nikki Haley, if she's going to win any primary, it's going to be in that circle. It's going to be in That's that right. circle, okay? If she's showing any more strength than that, the next great test for her is going to be Virginia. It's a, just like New Hampshire, anybody can vote. Mm -hmm. In fact, Marco Rubio came about three or four points short of knocking off Trump in 16. Virginia was sort of essentially his second to last stand before finally uh, succumbing to Florida. But, all right, Colorado, that's another place yeah. that maybe Nikki Haley can do well. In theory, Minnesota, because also they allow, so, but you start looking here, and then you have, for instance, in California, you have a 50% rule that once somebody gets 50% of the vote, then there's no proportional right. um, distribution of the delegates. It's Instead, it's winner take all. Could be winner take all by congressional district, which is three delegates at a time, or winner take all by the whole thing. I mean, just look at the, um, oh, sorry, here. Just look at these at the California right. stake here. I mean, sixty nine. I mean, the question's going to be: Is there any way, any performance on Super Tuesday, that gives her a rationale to stay in the race? I think she's got to win three or four states to have that rationale, because she's not going to have the delegates, but she might be able to have. Um, hey, there's a big portion of the electorate that still doesn't want Trump. But you know what's been interesting? What Nikki Haley has managed to do here, what her campaign has managed to do, people aren't necessarily talking about will she come out and give a concession speech tonight. We're talking about Super Tuesday. And I think the fact that people are talking about Super Tuesday maybe is something well, that they feel good her about. her campaign did that. However, she set her own bar tonight in that interview with Kristen Welker. She that said, she I've got to do better than I did in New She's Hampshire. walked away from that, Chuck. She did, right. 43%. Look, anything in the 40s tonight is a, is a moral victory for her. And if she gets into the 40s, Donald Trump will be um, not a happy man, and he probably won't be able to help himself, and he won't ignore her. That, to me, is the bar that I'm looking for tonight. Well, let me say this, because we've got 32 minutes, as I'm looking at our countdown clock just over here, and I'm coming back to you right after the break. 32 minutes until polls close, and we find out specifically, maybe, some of the numbers as to how that vote actually managed to turn out tonight. We're going to have it all on our special coverage of the South Carolina primary right here on NBC News Now. Our decision desk is crunching the numbers. Will they be able to make some kind of a projection? Stay with us.
live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Reporting over the skies of Lahaina. Every weeknight, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. with our special coverage of the South Carolina Republican primary. And you can see it here, 29 minutes to go until polls close. And when that happens, our numbers crunchers over at the, the decision desk may be able to make some kind of a characterization of this race. We don't know yet. Maybe too close to call, maybe too early to call. Either way, we're gonna get that picture just under a half an hour from now. We've still got a couple live shots up at different polling locations. You can see here down in RS33, folks voting. If you're watching us in South Carolina and you are in line, your vote counts. Remember, even after the polls close officially, if you are still waiting, remember the stakes here as we're taking a look at these watch parties. You see former President Trump's filling up. This is the microphone where we are all but certain to hear from Nikki Haley at some point in this evening. The former president wants to move closer in this march to the Republican nomination to putting Nikki Haley away, essentially. But Haley is promising to stay in this race. She wants to avoid what could be the biggest loss ever for a candidate in their home state. The question is, can she do that? The number you should be thinking about, 19 points. That's how much Marco Rubio lost to, to Donald Trump in his home state of Florida in 2016. I want to bring in now our all-star lineup of political pros tonight. Joseph Pinion, he is a Republican strategist and former New York Senate candidate. Columnist Mary Catherine Hamm, host of the podcast Getting Hammered. And Mark Lauder, former director of strategic communications for the former president's 2020 campaign. Okay, let me go right down the row here because we don't have firm numbers on vote. We do have firm numbers on exit polling. You've heard Chuck talk through it. You've heard Kristen talk through it. You've seen what our teams in the field have to say. Thoughts so far? Look, my, my thoughts so far is uh, much as expected. That people, even if you go back to no surprises for you here. So look, uh, you have to remember, you had the junior senator from the state in Tim Scott. You had the then governor of the state in Nikki Haley wrap their arm around Marco Rubio and said Marco Rubio is that generational change for the Republican Party. Uh, the senior senator for the state was backing Jeb Bush's last stand, and President Trump still took South Carolina. So I don't believe the issue was ever going to be whether South Carolinians like. Nikki Haley. I think the reality was that South Carolina is firmly entrenched as fertile ground for President Donald J. Trump. And I think the further away uh, we got from 2016, I think some people may have forgotten about that unfortunate fact. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen throughout this that, like, I wondered whether Trump would be treated like sort of an incumbent president or if he would be treated like this was really a, a race. But right? how interesting that that voter that Garrett Haig talked to at that watch party said as much, MK, that she right. felt like the former president was basically the incumbent here. Well, and I think that's what we've seen from voters. And you've seen that the Trump voters, even if they're not huge in raw numbers, because you'll see some turnout issues in various places and weather plays a part in that, but they are passionate, right? And I think the challenge for a Nikki Haley, and the same as for Dean Phillips on the other side of this, like running against Joe Biden, is the party obviously party apparatus not in your corner? Uh, the the folks who are for the incumbent are a little bit more passionate. You're speaking to voters who are a little apathetic, who are tired of the process, and so I think getting them out can be a tougher thing to do. A lot of the folks that Chuck Todd mentioned, the college-educated suburban moms, right? They are turned off by the process, and getting them mm. back in can sometimes be a harder move than it can to get the Trump voters out. Uh, I'm looking to uh, waiting for the numbers to start coming in. Something that Chuck mentioned that uh, with the lower turnout among college educated voters, uh, Donald Trump won 44 of 46 counties in South Carolina in 2016. The only two he lost, Richland, which is the home of Columbia, the state capital of the University of South Carolina, Charleston. If there is a drop in college educated voter turnout, Donald Trump's going to run the table and yeah. win all 46 counties, which now puts him up to nearly 200 counties. He's only lost two in this entire cycle, and one of them in Iowa was by one vote. Mark Lauder, you're really channeling your inner Chuck Todd political nerd here. <laughs> the numbers. Yeah. Get you know, the wall. I was going to yeah, say. I, mean, I have to say, that county, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> that come over here for a second, Chuck, because MK brought up something that I know you're yeah. interested in, and that is this idea, right? And, and what we're seeing in South Carolina, I was interested to hear from Jacob Soboroff at the polling location where he was at, and obviously one polling location does not a full narrative create, but the idea of where turnout is and the apathy that MK is talking there, about. This is, we're seeing it 
and, and, and a lot of places, right? For, first of all, there's been a lot of people noting, hey, n political news traffic is down. And it's regardless, left, right, it's mm -hmm. not like even one-sided. There seems to be less interest. Um, I saw some reporting, you know, California has got a, a heavy vote by mail state, and they can track how many ballots have been returned, and they share that data. Right now, it is tracking to be one of the lowest statewide turnouts, basically, since before Donald Trump descended down the escalator. It's sort of since, you know, 16, we'd been in a series of higher and higher turnouts. We had the highest ever midterm turnout in 100 years at 18. 22 was slightly down, but it was still a fairly substantial turnout. 2020, we saw a massive turnout, right? Highest that uh, we'd had in a generation. So that tells you something. It gets to what uh, Mayor Catherine is saying here. Because, uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, which is because I think it is these soft center-right voters mm. and the soft center-left voters that are not showing up to primaries, they're not tuning in, they're frustrated, they're exhausted, name it. You know, I look, I have a thesis on why we're seeing fewer women in the Republican Party. I think it has to do with Dobbs um, because it is a it is something that has been noticeable more so since Dobbs than it was even in the in the in the four years of Trump's term. So I think that has uh, one part of this impact. But overall, I mean, this is an exhausted, we, we know this, and Nikki Haley is counting on, she's counting on voters who are not enthusiastic about the process to show up. It's a tough thing to do. You're like, aren't you frustrated? Yeah, me too. Hey, now come, come on, on let's yeah, go. Show up I mean, on a Saturday to yeah, come I, out. It, and, it's, right, right. it's such a, it's like asking somebody to get excited about detention. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask <laughs> you know? our team in the control room to see if they can pull up some of the exit polling, and maybe you can help with this too, Chuck, sure. as it relates to reproductive rights and abortion access, if we have any of that stuff in yet. I don't think we had any of the uh, abortion uh, ones in there, but the majority of the South Carolina electorate, which you wouldn't be surprised, we do know that, favored a ban, uh, uh, some form of an abortion ban. But it was not 70-30. Not it was in the, in the mid-50s to uh, in low 40s, being against a ban. So, look, you know, there's a thesis to this election. We, we, it may be a very simple explanation. We, we're always so worried about Trump and Biden. Abortion could end up deciding this whole thing mm. at the end of the day because we're, we, you're, you're starting the way you see it chips away, particularly with what I think are going to be the most, among the most important voters, which are going to be um, independent women. I see you wanted to jump in. Well, I was doing some focus grouping, and by that I mean I was drinking Prosecco out of a uh, solo cup with some moms on the train uh, this week, and that is journalism. How do I live that life? Thank yeah, you. they offered it to me. It was a great time. What did the time. cab driver say? So right. yeah, yeah. But, did you get if, but they, we were, you know. I did. I did yeah. run into these ladies, and they're Color County, Philadelphia, uh, the, the voter, right? These are suburban, educated moms. They have sort of teenage and grown children. They're talking about some of their financial struggles. Um, but mostly they talked about how they don't even know if they'll vote. Hmm. And that is a feeling that I that I hear a lot from people in my demographic. Uh, the GOP has been hemorrhaging many of those voters that were center right, moderate women. Um, a Yunkin in Virginia, which is a different kind of candidate than than Trump, completely can maybe bring them back into the fold to some extent. Nikki Haley is making an argument to those voters and looking ahead and saying, "Look at this Marquette poll where I'm up 18." points, right? And that would matter, but you got to get there first, right? You're making an argument to a general election group but that's I, not necessarily in this. Primary. But I'll tell you, long term, though, that could be a problem for Joe Biden, yeah. because if he's counting on those female suburban voters to come out based on reproductive rights and because they're so angry about gas and grocery prices and immigration, they can't get themselves to cross over and come back and vote Republican. But if they don't vote, that's still a problem for Joe not Biden. The only part of the electorate that's apathetic right now, though. I, I, there is both numbers that prove this and my own anecdotal, unofficial, non Prosecco focus groups I mean, of, you should try of it. younger yeah. voters <laughs> who are having the same conversation. I don't know if I want to vote. Yeah. And you're sitting there going, really? They, they'll sit there in one hand, talk about all of these existential threats. And then like, but I just don't know because of whatever it is, a Gaza, Biden or whatever. So this apathy issue cuts across cuts a lot of different in a lot of different demographic groups. But it's across the board also, I think, to that point. If people have reached the point where they no longer believe that their vote matters or their engagement matters. And I think that is a bipartisan and nonpartisan issue that is going to be deeply impactful on this election. You go to Chicago, you come to New York City, you've got people who are African American, a, a group of people who are voting to the tune of nearly 85, 90% for Democrats, and they're saying you've got people who are entered this country, they've been here less than 48 hours, they're getting better treatment than we are. And we've lived here for 40 years and 50 years and 60 years. So.
all of these issues, the confluence of things happening on the southern border, the fact that anywhere you want to look abroad, we are, by many estimates, less safe today than we were when Joe Biden took the oath of office and pledged to be the return to normal president. People are looking at everything around the world and saying, you know what? I don't care what these people are going to do because my life is never going to get better. And I would agree that hurts somebody like Joe Biden the most who's holding together this fractured Obama coalition that arguably would have frayed a long time ago were it not for that once in a generational force, the pandemic that came and completely upended the entire political process four years ago. Before we can even get to this conversation, right, what does the general election look like? To MK's point, we got to get through tonight first. And I want to show you what you're seeing on screen here, top and bottom. These are the watch parties for former President Trump. That's up top. We understand that he is now in the building on this, of course, primary evening. At the bottom was Nikki Haley's po lectern, essentially, the microphone where she is set to speak. Let me take you back for just one second to the former president's watch party, because apparently uh, Senator Lindsey Graham is there. Staunch, diehard Donald Trump ally who's talking with her own Vaughn Hilliard, suggesting that it is time for Nikki Haley to get out of the race. Obviously, a home state senator here. We know the other home state senator, Tim Scott, has appeared with the former president on stage. He was out there in New Hampshire, right there with him, telling folks to get out and back former President Trump. So here you have Nikki Haley with no support from the congressional delegation or the senatorial delegation in her own state looking for maybe the closing of a margin that based on consistent polls has been roughly 30 points for weeks now. We're gonna have a lot more when we come back as polls are now 18 minutes from closing in our special coverage of the South Carolina primary. We're gonna hear directly from Nikki Haley's campaign next. Our decision desk is crunching all those numbers. We're about, like I said, 18, 20 minutes away from polls closing. Stay with us right here on NBC News Now. every second. News is more now than ever. Just outside of the Israeli military headquarters. Now is raw. This tunnel just goes on and on. Now is real. We get to see democracy in action for the very first time in the 2024 race. Now is constant. You gotta see this. Future is now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We 
are back with our special coverage of the South Carolina primary with just 15 minutes now until polls close. You can see those watch parties starting to fill up. Some of these polling locations, by the way, still open. You can see it down here at the bottom of our wall, down in 3337, I see them. We've got some live shots from some reporters up there, too. Uh, the decision desk as well. we got a lot going on tonight, and I want to bring in somebody who's right there in the center of it all, in the thick of it, the chair of the South Carolina Republican Party and the co-chairman of the Republican National Committee, Drew McKissick. I'm going to walk over here and say hi. Drew, talk to us about tonight, because you've said that at this point it may be time for Nikki Haley to do some soul searching. Do you think she should be staying in this race? Does that hurt her political future? Well, look, all I know is we've got enthusiasm here for South Carolina when it comes to Republicans and when it comes to our turnout. That's what we've seen all across the state so far with early voting. It's what we're seeing today. And after South Carolina voters speak, things tend to sort of wind up. We've got a tradition of being the graveyard of presidential campaigns here in South Carolina. Uh, I think at certain points, candidates, all candidates in any race, need to sit down and do a little bit of soul searching about how far they need to continue, whether it does them good, whether it does the party good, whether it puts us in a better state to actually go win in November. And that applies to every campaign. Give me a sense of your school of thought, um, because there's two of them inside the party. One is to essentially come out and kind of declare the former president the presumptive nominee right away. The other is to let the process play out, wait until you see if he has the delegates, hits that magic number. Where, where stand you? Well, you know, I think once things are over tonight here in South Carolina, uh, again, I think there will be a little bit of soul searching about how much further this process should go. Uh, once we have a presumptive nominee, which in, I would argue we should have after tonight, quite frankly, hmm. but uh, other you know individuals are going to have a little bit of a say in that, and they can make the decision themselves. But our job is to put the party together as quick as we can and be ready for the general election. That comes to fundraising, comes to organization, communications, that merger that we need of the campaign and the party at the national level and the state level to make sure that we go win in November. That's our job. So do you think then, Drew, given that, that if Nikki Haley does stay in the race, it would be hurting that uh, coalition that you're talking about here, the coalescing of resources behind well, the presumptive nominee? Well, from a timetable standpoint, I mean, it certainly affects that. I mean, the more runway that we have between now and Election Day, the better off we're going to be. No doubt about it. You know South Carolina. This is your state. You know it well. Nikki Haley knows it well. Is she hurting her future in that state by staying in? Well, look, I know what I've seen in terms of turnout and what I've seen so far for early voting and what I've seen anecdotally throughout this campaign. Uh, and I've seen tremendous support for Donald Trump up and down all across the state uh, and he has grown his coalition here since he won here for the first time back in 16 and I think that's what you're seeing in the polls I think the polls mm. were fairly accurate when it came to Iowa they were fairly accurate for New Hampshire and I think they're fairly accurate here when it comes to um, the argument that some make that Donald Trump is the de facto leader of the Republican Party right now there's been this question and I don't want to get in the weeds about it but there's been as you know some drama over the RNC who should lead the Republican National Committee I've got to ask you because your name has come up in this conversation is that a position for which you'd throw your hat into the ring well, the bottom line is it's about putting together a team and people who want to be a part of a winning team. I've always been a team player. I've worked in the Republican Party for 35 years now. And when it comes to bringing our nominee and the RNC together, I am for whatever works and make sure that we win in November, period, end of discussion. So then given that, Drew, do you believe, let me just ask you, that the RNC should be paying the former president's legal bills? What I think is when they come together and talk about fundraising or they come together and talk about how we spend money, it's always a question of how do we best use the different entities that we have and the laws that are on the books. I mean, it's the reason why the RNC doesn't do campaign ads, because the candidates get lower rates when it comes to campaign ads. Same reason why the RNC does most of the organizational work. Same reason why we use state parties to help raise money. This is a matter of using the laws that are on the books and using the different entities we have in the best way possible to make sure that we win. Period. Drew McKissick, I appreciate your time and what I know is a very busy night for you. We're going to see how this plays out with 11 minutes now until yes, polls close. Those turnout numbers. Drew, thank you. Again, uh, of course, the South Carolina Republican Party chair. Thanks. I want to bring in now Olivia Perez Kubis, spokesperson for the Nikki Haley campaign, who has been, thank you, Olivia, patiently standing by and waiting. Give us a sense of what you expect to hear, what we should expect to hear from former Governor Haley tonight. Look, we're excited.
excited. We're excited to be in South Carolina. It's another great day in South Carolina. What I can tell you is that tomorrow, Nikki will still be running for president. She heads to Michigan. We're hold, holding a big rally tomorrow night in Michigan. And over the next 10 days, we're going to be in over seven states. We have over 10 events, over 12 events. We're hitting the ground running, and we're excited for the road ahead. We're working hard to earn every vote. Not sure if you're able to hear our conversation that we just had with Drew McKiskick, of course, chair of the, of the South Carolina GOP, but he talked about the concern that he has, that if the party doesn't coalesce behind a nominee sooner rather than later, it could hurt Republicans' chances moving forward towards the general election. How do you respond to that argument, considering what was left unsaid was that Nikki Haley is the one perhaps standing in the way of that coalescing? I could hear the argument, and look, Nick, our souls are searched, right? We're in this for a reason. We're in this because 70% of Americans don't want another Biden-Trump rematch. 60% of Americans think that Biden and Trump are too old. We are talking about two of the most disliked politicians in America right now. Nikki is running to represent a new generation of conservative leadership. She is running because there's an appetite for what she's talking about. There's an appetite for her message. She's talking about making America normal again. There is nothing normal about what is happening right now. Nothing normal about the border. Nothing normal about the fact that there are two wars overseas. You asked him about Trump's legal fees. There's nothing normal about that. She is fighting to make America normal. She's fighting for civility again, and it's resonating. We talked about, and I don't, Chuck Todd was on the board with us, talking about the Super Tuesday landscape here. Because you tonight, Olivia, in this conversation are making very clear that Nikki Haley is planning to stay in this race, that she's in it for the long haul. I've heard your campaign talk about how you have the resources to make that happen. You have the money, you have the funding, you have the ability to do that. So flash forward to March 5th for us. And you and I are talking that night during our special coverage. Which state has Nikki Haley won? It's not about winning one state. We're fighting to win all the states. We're fighting and we're playing in all of these states. And at the end of the day, look, America doesn't do coronations. We have elections. Only four states have voted at this point. 20 plus states and territories are going to vote in 10 days. Let the people vote. Let them decide. And then we'll take it from there. Olivia, I have to ask, just because on the left side of our screen, we're showing what I think is the watch party for the Haley campaign here. Tell me about who, who's coming, turnout, who you expect to see tonight as we're showing some of these live shots here and I see folks walking through. Yeah, as you know, this is Nikki's home state. She was governor here twice. There are so many people here in this state who love her, who adore her. We expect a big crowd later tonight who are going to be watching returns, just going to be celebrating the fact that Nikki's made it this far. Look, a few months ago, Nikki was at 2% in the polls. She had absolutely no money in the bank. Nobody thought that she would be here. She has defied expectations and the odds at every turn, not just this campaign, but her entire life, if we're being honest. So we're this is a fun night. We're celebrating. We're excited and we're moving forward. We're forging ahead. Olivia Perez Cubas, thank you so much for being with us tonight there from the Haley campaign. Appreciate it. We have now looking at the clock, seven minutes left until polls close across South Carolina. We're going to sneak in a real quick break, but we'll be right back on the other side. Stay with us.
Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. So here we go, under five minutes until polls close now. And let's talk about one of those issues that Nikki Haley has made a big part of her closing arguments in South Carolina. You see her here in RS33. I'm going to have our team play that. Listen. Why can't they let go of the power? The party that dismisses their 80-year-old candidates is the party that will win president. There's a reason military, they make you retire before 65. We need people that are at the top of their game. Congress has become the most privileged nursing home in the country. So remember, Haley is 52 years old. Former President Trump, he's 77. President Biden is 81 years old. And if this year turns out to be Donald Trump versus Joe Biden, it would be the oldest matchup in American history because those two would be breaking their own record from 2020 when it was a four years younger Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Now, for his part, I want to go to him right here in 31, if we can play this, Brett. It's former President Trump. He's been super dismissive about concerns over his age. Listen. I've feel like I'm about 35 years old. I actually feel better now than I did 30 years ago. Here's the thing. Voters seem to be worried about this issue, and they seem to be more worried about President Biden's age than former President Trump's, with 76 percent of all voters, including half of Democrats, saying they have concerns about Joe Biden's mental and physical health, compared to about half of voters asked the same about Mr. Trump. So Haley, she has been hammering this message for weeks that she is the face of generational change. That has been her message, honestly, for months, really. The big question tonight, did it influence any votes in South Carolina? Let me show you, 32, that's where we have some some, uh, reaction that our team's getting in South Carolina. Listen to what voters are telling us about that. I feel like Nikki Haley did a better job than Trump. I didn't think Trump did a bad job, but I feel like mainly the age thing is is my issue. Trump obviously has no dementia (laughs) and the man has so much energy so if age plays a factor for you but you're still planning on voting for trump nikki just doesn't have the numbers she ain't gonna make it i'm voting for trump because it's the only choice even with nikki it could change so i don't i can't really base my vote on that on age So there it is, the voice of the voters there. And in our latest exit polls on who has the physical and mental health to serve, about 70% of voters say that both Nikki Haley and Donald Trump are fit. I want to bring it back to Chuck Todd here to talk through this piece of it, which is super important. It is. I want to actually go through the time of decision because you heard all that. She's been making this case over the last couple of months. For a long time. But at least this calendar year. But here's the real problem that she has. Look at this. We asked, when did you make up your mind in this election? Did you make it up just today? Just 3%. Last week, 5%. Earlier this month, 8%. In January, 6%. Look at this. This is bananas. That means this entire conversation she's been trying to have over the last two, two months hasn't mattered. Her closing argument has fallen on the ears of people who have already made up their minds. Well, what it also tells you is that this is a very static electorate. She needed a volatile electorate. If this had been a more volatile electorate, this time a decision number would have been in the 30 total, but you'd have had 30% still vacillating over the last couple of weeks. It shows you her message didn't penetrate voters enough to get them to show up. That's the issue. I think the people that are concerned about this didn't vote in this Republican primary. But this goes exactly back to the conversation that we were having with our political pros a few minutes ago, the idea of who actually is turning out and how much a candidate like Nikki Haley needs them to show up. Donald Trump's supporters are really enthusiastic about Donald Trump. Nikki Haley's supporters are really enthusiastic about hating Donald Trump, but they're not enthusiastic about her. That's the issue. But the whole conventional wisdom would say you got to flip that to get boots on the ground walking yeah. out to those polls. You got to you, ha- you have to you, you have to have a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, when you're straddling this, you know, 
John McCain was not conservative enough to be the Republican nominee, but he had a personal brand that brought people in. In fact, we've noticed it. This is not a high military. There's not as many military veterans showing up in this as when John McCain yeah. was running in this either. So it just tells you she's not built her brand. Chuck, thank you so much. I'm going to ask you to stand by because we are coming up now on the top of the hour. The polls in South Carolina about to close. When that countdown hits zero, our decision desk may be able to make a projection. Stay with us. This is an NBC News special, Decision 2024, the South Carolina primary. Reporting tonight, Hallie Jackson. Welcome back to our special coverage of the South Carolina presidential primary. And I want to show you the clock here. That's it, seven o'clock Eastern, basically zeros across the board if we were showing that to you, across the state, because this is it. Voters out there voting at this moment, wrapping up. If people were in line that could wait and wait, we got to pause because we are about to make a call in this race. NBC News can now make a projection that Donald Trump is projected to win the South Carolina primary. We do not have a margin yet. We do not know by how much, but polls have closed. And this is now our decision desk's projection. Donald Trump in South Carolina. It is not altogether an unexpected result, as we have been talking about for the last 60 minutes right here on NBC News Now, but it is obviously significant as his march to the Republican nomination continues on. He will be picking up delegates in this in this state. The question is how many? And the question for our Garrett Haik, who is at that Donald Trump watch party, is how much does he win by? What exactly is that margin? It's actually Vaughn Hilliard here at the watch party. And Vaughn, obviously some big news here for the Trump campaign. Talk us through what you're seeing and what you're hearing. Right, Hallie, and I actually just got word that the Trump, President Trump is uh, set to begin to speak here just moments from now. Hmm. Uh, this for Donald Trump was the state that so many looked at as the one place that could potentially be a barrier to him winning this Republican nomination. Why? Not only because of Nikki Haley, but also Tim Scott. I was here at his campaign South Carolina kickoff 13 months ago. He was joined by South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster, as well as Republican Senator Lindsey Graham. And I talked to voters. This is 13 months ago, Allie, who told me that they did not want their fellow South Carolinians, Nikki Haley and Tim Scott, to jump into the race because they thought that Donald Trump had a successful four years as president. They felt like the 2020 election, they contended to me, was stolen and that Donald Trump deserved to have another shot at it. Well, Tim Scott and Nikki Haley got into the race anyway. And here today, it's Nikki Haley, the last one standing. And in fact, I just talked to Lindsey Graham just a few moments ago, and I asked him, what was his message to Nikki Haley after? After tonight's defeat and he said it is time to unify as a Republican Party and it's time for Nikki Haley to step aside. She, to note, has made the case that she does not plan to do that. But this is a moment for the Republican what? Party where as time goes by, it keeps them from being able to put all of their resources towards the Democrats in beating Joe Biden in November. But for Donald Trump tonight, who we are now told is expected to take the stage here at any moment, you see the governor there, Henry McMaster, uh, right Senator near the podium. Scott, there, Senator Lindsey Graham, members Donald of the Trump, Trump family. Vaughn, this, this is, is a, a moment here. Talk about that moment. It is extraordinary that here you have the former president literally three minutes after polls closing, getting ready, it seems, to take the stage with supporters, with allies lining up behind him, giving him that backdrop. He is very clearly in this moment trying to send a message. Right. You know, and I talked to Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene this afternoon at a polling location, and she told me that in her conversations with Donald Trump, she urged him to not even talk about Nikki Haley going forward, mm. saying that she is null and void in her words. And you see Tim Scott, the senator here from South Carolina, who endorsed Donald Trump right before the Iowa caucuses, turning a lot of heads. This is a Republican Party that a lot of folks question, would there be a coalescing around a Trump alternative, like a Ron DeSantis or a Nikki Haley? But that's not what happened. When Ron DeSantis just dropped out of the race. He endorsed Donald Trump. And you see Tim Scott, who has been on the front lines here in South Carolina, introducing Donald Trump. This is a Republican Party that is turning to Donald Trump yet again for a third time, Allie. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you. I know you're going to be standing by as we're keeping an eye, of course, on this stage and this remarkable moment, Kristen Welker. The question is going to be, what kind of tone will we hear from former President Trump about this race? What kind of tone will we hear from former President Trump about specifically his remaining Republican rival here, Nikki Haley,
after he excoriated her last go around as the former president is taking the stage here, Kristen. We may have about 10 seconds before he begins to speak. I would just say, Hallie, that after former President Trump won in Iowa, we heard a remarkable conciliatory tone from former President Trump. Will we hear that tonight? That's the big question. We know a lot of his allies are pushing for that, for less yeah. grievance politics, if you will, Well, more focused on the issues. Let's listen in. We'll hear for ourselves what his tone will be as former President Donald Trump takes the stage in South Carolina. We're going to listen in for a few moments here as the former president seems to be soaking it in. Of course, NBC News projecting that he is the winner in this state. And the former president coming out delivering, frankly, the earliest speech he's delivered after polls closed this cycle so far, clearly intending to send a message as you see that room filled with supporters, that stage filled with allies as well, not just from South Carolina, but from across the country as well, including members of his family. This is a, you're, you're hearing that song, Proud to be an American. This is played over and over again at the former president's events. And you can see the enthusiasm there in that room at this significant moment for the former president as he continues he will pick up delegates here tonight. Not enough to clinch the Republican nomination. We're still a ways away from that. But it all comes as Nikki Haley is insisting she will stay in this race. You heard right here on this network just moments ago, one of her campaign advisors suggest their souls have been searched. They know what they're doing and they want to stay in here at least through Super Tuesday. It is challenging terrain, of course, for Haley, and that's why there's such a question mark as to what the former president will say and do here. Will he call on Haley to drop out? Will he deliver those personal insults that we have seen him deliver against her before? Or will he be more magnanimous, as we saw in those minutes after the very first contest of this primary season, the Iowa caucuses? Now remember, the question here is this, and if you're looking at the bottom of your screen, you should be, because that's where we are projecting former President Trump the winner. How much did he win by? What is the number? That is going to be significant here as well. Let's listen in to the former president. Thank you very much. Wow. That is really... Something. This was a little sooner than we anticipated. It was an even bigger win than we anticipated. And I was just informed that we got double the number of votes that has ever been received in the great state of South Carolina. So that's pretty good. So it's a record times two. And there's something going on in the country. Some really great things are going on. You look outside and you see all of the horror. You see millions and millions of people coming across the border illegally. We don't know where they come from. They come from jails. They come from prisons. They come from all sorts of places that we don't want to know. They come from mental institutions and insane asylums. And we don't want that in our country. We're not going to stand for it. We're not going to stand for it. You have terrorists coming in. You have people coming in that we just can't, uh, we can't do this. No country could, could sustain what's happening to the United States of America. No country. So we're going to straighten things out. The border is the worst it's ever been. You know, in 2016, we won and we had a bad border. And I talked about the border a lot, talked about it a lot. And uh, I said, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. We fixed it very quickly. And in 2020, we couldn't talk about it, although we did get millions of more votes a second time. But now there's a spirit that I have never seen. We ran two great races, but there's never been ever. There's never been a spirit like this. And I just want to say that I have never seen the Republican Party so unified as it is right now. Never been like this. And a big part of, uh, of that is the people standing behind me. These are, the, these are the biggest officials in South Carolina, but I say like the biggest officials in our country as far as I'm concerned. They're really, they're state figures, but they're national figures. And in the truest sense of the word, they love our country so much and they want to see our country succeed and be respected again. Right now, we're a laughing stock all over the world. Our country is going to be respected again, respected like never before. So this is a, a fantastic evening. It's an early evening and a fantastic. So you can all go down and you can Celebrate for about 15 minutes and we have to get back to work because the big date, the big date, you know, 
Michigan's coming up. We're doing great. The auto workers are going to be with us 100 percent because they got sold out by this country. But Michigan's up and uh, we're going to have a tremendous success there. And then we have a thing called Super Tuesday. And uh, I think we're leading 91 to 7 overall. Uh, if you don't mind, may I have the pleasure of introducing some incredible people? Because they stuck right from the beginning, from the very moment we announced, and, and they believe in make America great again. That's what they believe in. They believe in America first. We're putting America first. First of all, my family, Melania, Barron, Don Jr. and Kimberly, Ivanka and Jared, Tiffany and Michael. They're so, so supportive. So supportive of me, and we really appreciate it and love them. They're great. We have a great family, and we have incredible friends, and we're going to be up here on November 5th, and we're going to look at Joe Biden, and we're going to look him right in the eye. He's destroying our country, and we're going to say, Joe, you're fired. Get out. Get out, Joe. You're fired. And, uh, they're destroying our country, and we're going to... I just wish we could do it quicker. Nine months is a long time. I just wish we could do it quicker, Mr. Governor. I wish we, is there anything you can do with your vast powers to make that, you know, in certain countries, you're allowed to call your election date. If I had the right to do it, I'd do it tomorrow. I'd say, we're having an election tomorrow. Henry, is there anything you can do? I want to start off because right from the beginning, Henry McMaster, the governor of this incredible state, and, and much more importantly, his wife Peggy, she's with him all the way, I'll tell you. Never saw anything, what a couple. But I'd like to ask him to say a few words. He's a very special man, an incredible governor, very popular in the state, and uh, really, I mean, he gave us some very good advice, and he has right from the beginning, you know, from the day I announced I had the lieutenant governor, he was the lieutenant governor, and from right at the beginning, when I announced, then I said, I don't know the gentleman, is he good? They said, he's really great. I said, well, I hope so. And you know what, within about two weeks, I said, that guy is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, I never got the support of the governor. She supported somebody else, but I had the support of somebody much, much better, Henry McMaster, and we won in a landslide. And I'd like to ask the governor to say a few words, please, Henry. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be very brief. Y'all, I would like you all to remember this moment that you were here. This is a great moment in American history. We will probably never see another one like it. Every time a, a rocket launches, you know, it goes up slow and then it's climbing and climbing and then boom, that next stage comes off and it goes, well, we just did that. We just hit maximum velocity and we're going all the way. So I'm going to ask somebody else to say because he came on board and Lindsay wanted him and the <laughs> lieutenant governor wanted him and everybody wanted him. Henry and Peggy wanted him. So I thought he was okay, but he didn't love speaking about himself because he's a good person. See, I have no problem with that. It's a problem. <laughs> what a personality. I don't know. But he endorsed me, and then we asked him to go and do a few shows. And, you know, they're not often nice shows. They're very hostile. And what he did was, I said, is this the same man? And he campaigned nicely, but he's a f high quality person. When he was supporting me, the day, is that correct, Lindsay? When he went out, yeah. Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott, he went out and he was ripping it. I said, I said, what happened to Tim Scott? What a dynamo. And he has been one of our great advocates. He's been doing things that have been unbelievable. And I'm just very happy he didn't have that same energy drive because I think I probably would have been out of the race a long time ago. But I want to say a very special man. I, I really do mean it. So many people have such great respect for him and you're very lucky to have him in the state. Tim, please say a few words. Hello, South Carolina! The longer, the longer I speak, 
the less you hear of him. So let me just ask one survey question, and you better answer it loud and clear. Yeah. Is South Carolina Trump country? Yeah. Thank you very much, Tim. Really great job, amazing. Another man, not a lot of people know him. He doesn't do too much television. He happens to be a little bit uh, further left than some of the people on the stage. But I always say, when I'm in trouble on the left, I call up Lindsey Graham and he straightens it out so fast. And I'll tell you, no, 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 remember, remember. What? Love him. He's a good man. Come up here, Lindsay. Come up here, Lindsay. Come here. Okay, are you ready? America, the nightmare you're facing is just about over. Help is on the way. This is the most qualified man to be president of the United States. And let it be said that South Carolina created the biggest political comeback in American history. Thank you, Lincoln. So, I have a son who's a very talented guy and he works so hard and we love him and his wife is very good. She goes on and Laura. And I want to thank Eric and Laura for doing such a fantastic job. And Really, really amazing. They're amazing people. Uh, let's go down a little list of some of the people that are up here tonight because every one of them is a star in their own right. And uh, your lieutenant governor is going places. You do know that, right? Yeah. Pamela Evett. And really going places. And Speaker of the House, Merle Smith, who's uh, coming up in a couple, you know, some of these people are actually busy. He's running to get over here. But we want to thank you, Speaker of the House. Fantastic person, doing a great job for the state. An attorney general who's been in the news lately a lot, winning cases. Oh, I wish we had such a good attorney general like that in New York. Oh. <laughs> He's a great attorney general. Alan Wilson, thank you, Alan. His father happens to be up here, too. Remember his famous, you lied, remember? <laughs> he's, been, he's been loved ever since, hasn't he, huh? Treasure Curtis Loftus. Curtis, thank you very much, wherever you may be. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Mark Hammond, Secretary of State. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Ambassador. And this is a great ambassador, one of the best. Anytime we had a problem, I just call Ed McMullen, and he would solve the problem very quickly. Ed, thank you very much. We have a man who's done a really good job in the state, your South Carolina GOP chair, Drew McKissick. Thank you. Thank you. opinionated group of people. I'll tell you, they turned very positive on you very quickly, Elizabeth. We won. So, you have a beautiful, beautiful state right next to you, North Carolina. We love North Carolina, right? In fact, they named their daughter Carolina. And I said, which state? She said both. <laughs> She's very, I think I know which say, but that's okay. But they, uh, they have the most beautiful daughter named Carolina. So we love, we love the, both of them. We love them both very much. And we want them both very easily. And one of the reasons we won North Carolina is a man named Michael Watley, who looks like, who looks to me, we gave him our endorsement, and he looks to me like he's going to be going on to the National Republican Party. As the boss, Michael Watley. Where is Michael? Michael, thank you very much. And he's going to be working with Laura. 
And we may be putting Kellyanne in the group, too. Do we like Kellyanne? We love Kellyanne, right? But uh, you're going to do a fantastic job, both of you. We appreciate it very much. What a job he's done in North Carolina. You have been listening to former President Trump there taking the stage in South Carolina after NBC News is projecting him the winner of that state's primary tonight. You heard a lot from Donald Trump there, but what you didn't hear, the name Nikki Haley, with no reference so far to his remaining Republican rival in this race, a rival who is insisting she will not get out until at least Super Tuesday. I wanna to get to Garrett Haake, who is live for us at that Trump watch party there. Uh, and Garrett, setting aside the smattering of booze for South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham at one point, this has been a speech where the, the former yeah. president has come out within minutes of polls closing to send a definitive message, it seems, to the rest of the party. That's my kind of guy, so I appreciate it. Great job. We're yeah, I think that's right, Hallie. Look, this is classic Trump. They had a very specific plan here that they wanted to make sure he came out first, he, that he would speak before Nikki Haley, and that he could give a message that this race, he believes, is over, and that it's time for the party to unite behind him. He wanted to give that same message in New Hampshire, and then Nikki Haley beat him out, and we all remember how angry and disjointed that New Hampshire speech was. So his campaign was hoping to avoid that tonight. They brought him out early but you'll note that there's no teleprompter here tonight these are not scripted remarks so he is off the cuff here and making a point to thank all the people behind him to project the kind of unity that he wants to see in this party but even at the edges you see the challenges to that the, uh, vocal and lust, lusty booze for Lindsey Graham I mean he, nothing Donald Trump could say could make Lindsey Graham popular in this room a state that he represents likewise for the South Carolina State Party chair so you see some of the tension uh, in the party that Donald Trump has created here. He's gone on to talk about the changes that he intends to make in the Republican National Committee. He's like Michael Watley, a name that some of our viewers may be familiar with, but all of them likely will be soon, who Trump has said will be taking over the RNC, will be the boss instead of Ronna McDaniel in the not-too-distant future. He said it on stage now that this is happening. So what you're seeing here is the completion of a sort of takeover effort here of the Republican Party from Donald Trump, and almost entirely ignoring the fact that this race is, at least technically, not over yet, Alan. At least technically. Garrett Haake live for us there at that Donald Trump watch party as the former president describes it as, for him, a fantastic evening, but also an early evening. And Ali Vitale well knows early it is, friend. Polls just closed not even 22 minutes ago. Give us a sense of what the expectation is now from the Haley camp. I know the room behind you is starting to fill up. The music is getting a little louder. I would imagine we'd expect to be seeing the former governor of this state at some point. With one key question still remaining, Ali, and that is, while we are projecting former President Trump the winner, we don't know yet by how much. There just is not enough vote in yet, and we're exactly. seeing some of the numbers down at the bottom of the screen. We gotta see more vote to determine what exactly are the margins here. Talk us through it. The margins are going to be the key, Hallie, because even just in the last hour, as I was talking with Nikki Haley's campaign manager, I said to her, and this is true, it's rare that you don't have to argue with the campaign about who's going to win this state. Instead, the Haley campaign is aware of the fact that they are going to lose here, a state that Haley herself is from, grew up in, has friends who voted for her in the polls today, was elected twice statewide as a governor, and yet is still going to lose in this Republican primary. It's not going to be a moment of her hometown coming in to save her in the 11th hour of this campaign. But the question is what the margins are going to look like. And I know that some of the areas that I'm looking closely at are places like Charleston County, one of the biggest voting populations here, also the place or nearby the place that Nikki Haley herself calls home. And I did see many, many people in lines outside in those polling places today. One of the only polling places, frankly, as we had people fanned out across the state that actually had folks in line having to wait to cast their ballots. I'll bring you inside the room here a little bit though, Hallie, because as we saw Donald Trump on stage, immediately learning the lessons of New Hampshire, cutting Nikki Haley off at the pass, getting his victory message out there as early as he possibly could, he did it with members of the South Carolina delegation behind him, most notably Senator Tim Scott, who Nikki Haley first appointed to his Senate seat, mm -hmm. Governor Henry McMaster, someone who Haley would often remind us, trounced as they were both running for governor back in the last time she mounted a bid to be the chief executive of this state. As Trump and his allies were on stage, there's a projector here, as there often is at headquarters on campaign election nights. The screens were showing the former president and all of his allies, and someone here in the room, one of the supporters, 
started standing in front of the projector trying to block the screen as other attendees in this room started chanting for Nikki Haley. They are aware of the fact they are the underdog. They're trying to ignore the fact that Trump has taken a victory lap right now. And we're very actively playing the waiting game for Nikki Haley, who has been clear. And I think that takes maybe some of the drama out of tonight. But she's been clear that regardless of what happens here on Saturday night, Come Sunday morning tomorrow, she is still going to be running for president. She's going to be heading to Michigan, and then she's going to be barn barnstorming the Super Tuesday states, trying to get her message out to as many people as possible in this closing period of the campaign. I will say, I've noticed a striking difference between the way that Haley talks about Super Tuesday as a natural inflection point, maybe a reassessment point, and her campaign. Haley says, I haven't thought past Super Tuesday. I asked her campaign manager, who's literally paid to think past Super Tuesday, what the plan was. And she said they're staffed out through the end of March. That means states like Georgia. So a little bit of dissonance there. But still, the campaign manager's not saying they're definitely staying in. Ali Vitali live for us there at Nikki Haley's headquarters for the evening. I want to get to Kristen Welker because if there is a question mark tonight, Kristen, and I think that there is, it's about the tone that Nikki Haley comes out with. You described her earlier in our special coverage here as defiant in many ways, talking about wanting to stay in this race. Is that the kind of Nikki Haley energy that we're going to get when she takes this stage? Or will there be some wind out of her sails, given what is happening in the state that she calls home, the state where she was governor for years? We cannot emphasize that enough. And a state where she now potentially, Kristen, runs the risk of losing, perhaps, by an historic margin. And, Hallie, let me add one more data point to that. In a state where she has never lost... I think that she will try to keep her chin up, but there is no doubt she is human. This is going to sting. And of course, as we've been talking about throughout the evening, we will wait to see what the actual margin is. But the fact that we were able to call this so early gives you an indication of just how significant this win was by former President Trump. So I think that you are going to hear a defiant Nikki Haley, but one who's also been a bit chastened as well. There's no doubt about that. Look, uh, let me just make a couple of points about former Former President Trump, I asked one of his top advisors, Jason Miller, why was it important for him to come out so early? Here's what he said. President Trump is ready to start the general election against hmm. Joe Biden. Let's start now. This was about optics, Hallie, seizing this moment, trying to look beyond South Carolina towards the general election, towards November. A lot of people will take note of a comment that Mr. Trump made joking about potentially moving the election up, saying that he doesn't want to wait until November. Some will see that as anti-democratic. He talked about the fact that in some countries they do that. So I think that's a comment that's going to get a lot of scrutiny. But look, big picture, he wanted to make the case that this race is over, even if Nikki Haley doesn't get out tonight. The optics also of all of those top Republicans converged behind him. And remember, Hallie, those are endorsements that he secured in the wake of New Hampshire. That's when we really started to see the party close ranks around him, including Tim Scott. It is not a mistake that Tim Scott is hmm. behind him at a lot of these events, Hallie. We know that he is at the top of that short list of potential VP picks. He talked tonight. That is not unusual. So we have our eye on him as well, Hallie. Kristen Welker, a lot to be thinking about tonight, a lot to be digesting ahead of Meet the Press tomorrow. And we're looking forward to watching you, of course, moderate with your guests and panel on NBC News. As you were seeing on screen there, Donald Trump still speaking now at his watch party. Nikki Haley likely to speak perhaps any minute. You see it on the right side of the screen, down on the bottom. That's where her headquarters is. We are standing by for that as the former president tries to make the case that it is time to turn to the general election and Nikki Haley tries to make the case. Not yet. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to our special coverage of the South Carolina presidential primary. And you already know the big headline here. NBC News projecting former President Donald Trump the winner in a landslide victory in South Carolina. The question is, what does the landslide mean? Is it a landslide that could make history here? As you see the numbers coming in, we've got just about 6% of the vote in. Not much vote in yet. We are looking to get those numbers obviously up, see where things really stand. Still too early, but we know that it's big. Here's the number that Nikki Haley might be looking toward. 19, right? That is the margin that Senator Marco Rubio lost to in his home state in a Republican primary. The most that any candidate, perhaps until now, has lost by in a GOP presidential nomination contest. So if, in fact, Nikki Haley loses by more than 19 points, she will be making history in a way that she almost certainly does not want to in her home state. You are looking now live at a picture of former President Trump on stage in South Carolina. He has just departed. He came out right away, called it an early evening and a fantastic one. He talked about the spirit of a unified Republican Party, but he did not say two words. He didn't say Nikki. He didn't say Haley. Take a look at this. We're looking at some of the live shots here of Haley headquarters. You can see our correspondent Ali Vitali up there in RS-22. You see RS-33 there. That's former President Trump. And 34, also the former president's watch party. This is the one we're looking at. 35, that row of flags there. Haley HQ, where... The former governor of this state is expected to speak perhaps at any minute. Will she say two words? Will she say Donald Trump? One big issue tonight, Nikki Haley seemed to not be able to convince Republicans that she was in fact the best choice in a general election. Our exit polls show that just over half of voters thought that she could beat in fact President Biden, but more than 80% think that Donald Trump can even though he has lost to President Biden before. And that brings us to some more exit polling here over with Chuck Todd at our big board. What drove the former president's victory in this state? What groups showed up? What groups turned out? Well, I'll just make it pretty simple here. We'll start with ideology, right, which is overall basically 80 percent of this electorate called itself conservative. Uh, the rest, the t basic t little over 20 percent called themselves moderate or liberal. So let me just show you what the number was. Among conservative voters, Donald Trump won 74 percent of the 80 percent. Think about that. 74 percent of the 80 percent. Now, of the 20 percent, how much did Nikki Haley win? She won 67 percent of the 20 percent. I'm not asking you to do uh, uh, complicated math here, but you can see that makes it quite difficult. She is winning with the voters she's trying to concentrate on, but those voters, they're just not enough of them. Let's go with education. This is an important split that we've been tracking throughout Trump's remaking of the Republican Party. This was an electorate that was uh, far less college educated than the last South Carolina electorate in 2016. As you could see, this time it's 57%. Last time it was a majority of voters. Uh, had a college education in South Carolina. But look at this split. Among non-college educated, 75% picked Trump, just 25% for Haley. And you can look among college educated, Haley did well, but she didn't win the group. She actually still lost that group, 51-47. A lot more we could tell you, but I think that basically tells the story. Well, if a, if a picture is worth a thousand words, the exit polls are worth a million words, perhaps, <laughs> as we look at some of those charts. And Mark Lauder, I know you've been nerding out with Chuck on some of this stuff here. Talk us through this, right? What this says to us about the next contest that we'll be looking ahead to. Um, obviously, there's Michigan, but Super Tuesday on March 5th. It doesn't look good for Nikki Haley. I mean, I know she's trying to hang around and, you know, but I looked at some of the, the latest polling. I mean, California, Trump 52, North Carolina, Trump 57, Michigan 80 to 18 right now, according to the latest polls that I've been able to find. I mean, these are, these are just devastating numbers. I mean, this is, Nikki Haley is not a speed bump in Donald Trump's path to the nomination. She's a mosquito on the car windshield. He is running her over. I mean, that, tough words, Mark. I mean, <laughs> and what's interesting here is we have not heard former President Trump echo that tonight. He did not go after Nikki Haley in those personal terms, as we are waiting now to see. As you take a look at your screen, on the right side, you can see the sort of leftover of what is happening at the former president's watch party. On the bottom, of course, Nikki Haley, where we think we will see her perhaps any minute here. And Joe, her tone is going to be relevant here. Her tone is going to matter. And what she says will give us some insight into where she's headed. Her campaign has insisted, and you heard Heard one of her people say earlier to us, essentially, we don't have to do any soul searching. Our souls have been searched. We are staying in this race. 
Look, I, she's going to have to at some point make the case for why staying in matters. Does she think Trump is going to have some type of catastrophic collapse? Then she needs to say that. But most people looking at this think of the third M. We talked about momentum. We talked about math. You have to start talking about money because every time a donor uh, gives Nikki Haley another million dollars, a Republican candidate for Congress weeps uh, and the DNC rejoices. We are going to have a massive deficit when it comes to money. We've already invested over two billion dollars on this Republican primary for president when you add in the PAC money and the money given directly to candidates. So uh, considering that you have Republicans trying to reignite the grassroots fundraising in an effort to close the gap that has existed now consistently between Republicans and Democrats, that's going to be the real thing on the minds. I think that's why the pressure continues to mount on Nikki Haley to get out of this race. But part of the case she has also been trying to make is that she is in this race to serve as a choice for the part of the Republican Party. Party, not a big part, not the majority part, but the smaller part of the Republican Party who is looking for somebody other than former President Trump to be the nominee. And MK, I, I know that you can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, but the fact is the math is not mathing, as the kids say. Um, and what, what the primary electorate on both sides is saying very loudly is, uh, no, we do want to do 2020 but older. It's going to be great, guys. Um, and what Nikki Haley is offering is saying, well, and I don't think it's crazy to stay in a race and go, Maybe I am an alternative that went through some of this process. This is an unprecedented, uh, we have unprecedented age problems, possible mm -hmm. health problems, very serious legal problems. I've been through the process. I earned some votes from these skeptical voters. I was in the debates. I took it to him. Uh, at the end, I'm still standing. Right. And maybe you need me in some way. But I don't know if that actually works out that way. The, I just I mean, think it's not a bad. And argument. the delegates have been chosen by the Trump campaign. Right. I mean, when the state, when the county parties and the national parties are picking delegates, they are Trump delegates Let's who will make that decision in that week. Back up like a half a step, though. Right. Because you heard the former president allude to this a little bit. He made a reference to the New York, uh, I believe, state attorney general there, who obviously he has he has clashed with. Um, but the, the case that you're talking about, MK and Joe and Mark, the Nikki Haley, maybe she's staying in case something were to happen like a Conviction, perhaps it is not Chuck. It is not a guarantee. It's not as though. Let's be clear about this. Yeah. It's not like the nomination. If former President Trump locks it up, would automatically default to Nikki Haley just because she stayed in the longest. We got to be clear about that. Well, and you already have majorities do not believe right. It, this 34 percent of Republican voters in South Carolina said Trump would. They would not consider Trump fit for president if he was convicted. That number was 42 percent New Hampshire. Number 31. By the way, that 42 percent number is about what Nikki Haley got in New Hampshire at 43s, right? And, and so the point is, is I, I don't know if there would be a collapse of Republican support. My guess is the numbers wouldn't even be that much if it actually happened, number one. But let's say he's somehow out. Yes, there, there are rules. At that point, it all, some of it depends. Would he get out, would there still be some primaries left? Would there be an opportunity for her to maybe win a late primary to get delegates? That's possible. Or let's say he got out after I mean, the Jack Smith trial is trending to a June-July, not something before the end of the primary season, and the primaries end in June. Let's say it happens before the convention. Well, then, then the rules are fight club. It's, it's there a are no, The first rule of fight club is there are no rules. <laughs> right. At that point, that's what the Republican convention would be. I thought the first rule about fight club is you don't talk about fight club. Sorry about that. You're right. All right. That's Very the first rule. <laughs> the second rule is that there are no rules. Chuck, thank you. Listen, speaking of, obviously, fights, including the fight for the Republican nomination, Nikki Haley is hoping to make it one. We will see what she has to say any second. You see, of course, the bottom corner of your screen. That is where we expect her to speak. Stick around. We're going to sneak in one more break.
News lives in the now. The horrors of the war on full display on both sides of the Israel-Gaza border. Protesters are on the streets here. Most of the time, the Iron Dome works, but a few get through. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We are back with our special coverage of the South Carolina primary. You see it here on our big wall. This is the headquarters of the Nikki Haley team, the Nikki Haley campaign there in RS-35. I'm going to ask our director, Brett, to pull that up full because you can see that crowd is starting to get hyped despite, of course, the big news, which is Donald Trump, the projected winner of this state's primary here. Only about 11 percent of the vote in. You can see where the margins are. Those numbers down here are going to change. The margin is obviously a key question. I want to bring in Caton Dawson now, a former chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party and a Nikki Haley supporter. Uh, I have to imagine perhaps some disappointment tonight. What do you hope to hear from Nikki Haley in just a couple of minutes, potentially? I hope to hear the optimism. I mean, certainly it's uh, it's it's um, disappointing, but we're going to do better than forty percent, and 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 certainly beat the margins that tonight? Donald Trump said of thirty and thirty five percent. So we didn't win it, but we we showed up. There are a couple of things going on here, Haley. I mean, we, right now. Uh, there's two things to give credit for on that stage, and, and Henry Master was one of them. Uh, Nikki's been gone from office for eight years. Mm. Henry has been in office for eight years, and let's give credit to the sitting governor who endorsed Henry, the first elected official in the country. That mattered in this election. The next one was the Speaker of the House, Merle Smith, who brought almost 100 uh, uh, elected officials with him. Those two endorsements were hard to get over. I'll move past that and say Nikki Haley dusted off 12 people, you know, like 12 people to get here to have her versus Donald Trump. Uh, pretty amazing. We have the money, we have a talented staff, we have the energy and excitement to move on to Michigan and Super Tuesday and continue to let Republicans vote on who they want. There's one problem sitting out there and they can't blame it on Nikki Haley. And the problem is uh, President Trump's got to find an attractive way to go after that 42 percent of Republicans who were voting for Nikki Haley and, 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 and are enthusiastic about her. We need a bigger Republican Party, not a smaller Republican Party. And uh, again, we'll just, you know, we're used to fighting in South Carolina. We're used to winning and losing. I was the chairman of the party, mm -hmm. over 700 races sitting right at this desk, and we won most of them. Uh, the Democrat Party is void in South Carolina, so we're going to move on to Michigan and on to Super Tuesday, and then we'll make another decision. Kate, and I hear you talk about 42 percent of the Republican Party, perhaps in New Hampshire, but we have not seen those kinds of numbers for the former governor of South Carolina in many other places. And she has a tough road ahead. You know this. You're looking at that Super Tuesday map as well. What is her path? And at what point do you believe that she has given Republican voters enough of a choice and they have said what their choice is and it's not her? Well, and, and, and that'll be up to Nikki to make that decision, but we're going to let, you know, 10 more states vote. And, and, and if they want to send us that message, we'll take it. Uh, they don't need to put it up in a hot air balloon. We'll read it. Uh, but, but it's a competition. There were 12 people in it. It's now Nikki Haley, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. One of the three is probably going to be president of the United States. We're not standing in his way. This is a contest. We have teams up in Alaska, Virginia. Uh, we put people there up on the ground, and we've got, uh, again, very generous donors that have helped us tremendously so we can afford to go do this. Let me ask you this, Caitlin, because one of our political pros here on Set Joe Opinion made the point that for every million dollars that Nikki Haley now gets from a donor to continue this fight moving forward is perhaps a million dollars that is not going into the coffers of a vulnerable Republican who may need to win his or her seat come November. Do you think that's a fair uh, no. argument here? about resources I, I and where not. resources raised, are going. I've raised millions and millions of dollars for the Republican Party, millions. And I can tell you that there's plenty of money out there to go be to raise. We're not going to be penny pension. The RNC is broke. That's why they're changing. Donald Trump is mm. broke because he keeps spending money on, on, on his legal fees. I mean, we're, we're, 
This is a good testing point. What you're hearing from Nikki Haley, and I, I listened to all the stuff today, what you're hearing from Nikki Haley is going to get in a megaphone with the Democrats. So we better flush all of these bad things out that we need on our on our on our candidate, whoever it's going to be, Nikki or Donald Trump. And we'll move past that and we'll try to unify the party. But right now, uh, uh, Nikki's scrappy now. I mean, she doesn't give up okay. anything easy. It's how she became governor. And uh, I'm proud to be with her. Kate and Dawson, we're glad to have you tonight. Thank you so much for your time and for being with us here. I appreciate it. You have been watching as Kate has been speaking, of course, that Nikki Haley watch party. We expect to see her. You see that down here on RS35. But I want to draw your attention a little higher up to the corner there to Trump headquarters where Hogan Gidley is standing by, somebody who, of course, is a Donald Trump supporter who's been spending some time on the ground in South Carolina. And Hogan, I know, in the air with former President Trump. Give us a sense of how the campaign is feeling moving into this next stretch of campaigning. Oh, very excited, uh, Hallie. I was uh, on the plane with Donald Trump on the way down here. As you mentioned, though, for the last several days, I've been traveling around South Carolina as well. The enthusiasm for him is through the roof in the Palmetto State. You've seen now he's 4-0 in these contests, obviously winning Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and now South Carolina as well, winning in all the regions in this country, the West, the Northeast, the Southeast, and the Midwest. So it clearly is his party right now, and the elation backstage could be felt here. We were all very excited. The fact that as soon as the polls close, they call it for Donald Trump. It just shows kind of the stranglehold he has on the uh, GOP electorate, the people who want to return to those America first policies. And you're seeing a reflection of that in these massive numbers for him here in South Carolina. What do you make of the fact that he did not mention Nikki Haley so far as we heard in his speech tonight? Well, look, I think Donald Trump has long been looking forward to the general election taking on Joe Biden because that's the real enemy here. And obviously, when someone like Nikki Haley wants to stay around, look, cameras, money and ego are a hell of a drug. You know what I mean? And so she's trying to prolong this as long as she can because she has the money to do it. She's not really taking a look at what's best for the party or what's best for the GOP. She's looking at what's best for Nikki Haley. That's a shame, but that's part of the deal. She wants to stay in the race as long as she can. But the voters have been pretty you know, consistent at rejecting her message, that desire to return back to the globalists and the corporatists and the elitist GOP of the late 90s and early 2000s. And so I imagine she's going to stay in it as long as she wants. But Donald Trump is focused on getting this country back on track, reinstalling those policies that gave us a rational, sane, secure southern border that had crime down in cities. And of course, didn't make wars break out all over the world as well. Uh, his, his domestic policy uh, is unparalleled, way better than Joe Biden's. His foreign policy, the same. And so he's focused on that right now. It's pretty clear. You talk about him being focused on the campaign, Hogan, but there's a lot of other stuff going on as it relates to the courts, because you look at the calendar ahead and you look at the yeah. overlay of the former president's multiple legal issues with the campaign that he's got to run. You see the calendar here. You've got that federal election case trial, TBD timeline, classified documents trial. Look at how this fits to the convention, what's happening in Georgia, etc. Does this not become an issue further down the road for the former president as he splits his time between these legal issues and the campaign? Or do you think that his legal troubles are actually helping him with the primary electorate? Well, they've obviously helped him a lot with this primary electorate. It seems like every time the left or, or these three-letter agencies do something to Donald Trump, his numbers tend to spike. So it's obvious. As we but get can closer I just ask you, I don't, I don't general, mean to interrupt you, Hogan, but you know, I just want to ask you this. But what about in a general? Right, because I, I hear what you're saying on the primary. We have a series of data points suggesting that he has raised yeah, more money, that he has sure. gotten more enthusiasm from, importantly, Republicans with these legal issues. We have not seen that same kind of evidence as it relates to a general election. And in fact, this may be a political risk for him. Well, that's exactly what I was about to say. As you look at the general and start to fixate on what that means for him in the general, it also becomes another campaign issue he can run on and point to the weaponization of the federal government of three-letter agencies going after him, doing things to him that they're not doing to Joe Biden. When you see documents uh, being held by Donald Trump, documents being held by the president of the United States right now, and when they go after one person and not the other, it is kind of jarring the juxtaposition to the electorate. It remains to be seen what it's going to mean for the general election. I can just tell you, Donald Trump sees this as a, a really good, strong issue to kind of point out what's going on in this country. And he's not the only one being targeted. You heard him say this before. He said it many times. 
it's the American people who are being targeted. If you like the wrong tweet or you download the wrong podcast or you attend the wrong speech, the government tends to go after those who they don't agree with politically. And, uh, and folks in this country are starting to wake up to that. Now, what that means, uh, you know, long term for the general, that remains to be seen. But no, make no mistake about that. It will be a campaign issue that he runs on. Hogan Gidley there for us at Trump campaign headquarters. Hogan, thank you very much. You've heard now from folks at both watch parties, surrogates of both campaigns and candidates. And this is now the number that we are watching for tonight. You see 22 percent of the vote in. And there it is, the projected winner, former President Trump at 56 percent and Nikki Haley's 43 percent. Listen, gang, these numbers are going to change, right? And that's the thing that we're going to be looking for. Where does this land and where does this land? What is the margin? This is going to be a projected loss for Nikki Haley in her home state of South Carolina. What does that loss look like? We're going to be watching for more of those numbers as they come in with our decision desk waiting to get that vote in. As you can see on screen, you see, of course, the rest of the action here all across the state of South Carolina as we will be back with our special coverage right here on NBC News Now. Waiting, of course, for Nikki Haley to speak any minute. Fire has grown uh, leaps and bounds. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Oh, pretty, pretty bad. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. The latest developments in the war between Israel and Hamas. You do have points or you have miles. Is now a good time to use them? The first woman on a lunar mission. What was it like to get that news? Morning News Now. Streaming weekdays at 7. You are taking a live look now at Nikki Haley's campaign headquarters, where we expect to hear from her potentially any minute after NBC News is projecting that Donald Trump is winning the South Carolina Republican primary. Not an unexpected result, as the former president is looking to make the turn now to the general election. We will see what tone Nikki Haley strikes when she speaks, perhaps any minute from now. I want to bring in David Pluff, former Obama campaign manager and NBC News political analyst. So he said... There's Donald Trump looking to portray a show of unity on that stage behind him. People from South Carolina, people from across the country, trying to make the case that his march to the nomination is essentially inevitable. Talk to us then as we look ahead, maybe to the general. What does that look like 
for your side of the aisle? Well, he should have done that in New Hampshire. So his redo was the speech he should have given back then. And you're referencing that speech after New Hampshire? Yeah, it was all Nikki kind Hampton of a uh, yeah, very small uh, attack. He should have just moved on to the general then. So we did it now. Listen, this is kind of the geriatric cage match most America doesn't want, but that's what they're going to get. And it's going to come down to six states. It's going to be super close. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes we overcomplicate politics. Six states, a couple million people. 4% of the people in those six states are true undecided voters. I would guess Biden has a better chance to do what he needs to do there than Trump, because I think a lot of those voters just are not going to be up for a return. The challenge will be Trump, I think, has more energy than Biden. So uh, turnout is equally as important. Uh, and it's not just turnout, it's complicated by third party vote. Because Donald Trump has a much easier chance, as he did in 16, winning with 46, 47 mm -hmm. percent of the vote than 50. So um, it's going to be, I think, an ugly race. Uh, but right now, I think Trump has more of his supporters excited about the race than Biden. Does. So and, that's the big challenge for Biden. Well, and look at the decisive win that he has tonight. Again, we don't know what the final margin will be, but we know based on that early projection that it is going to be significant. Does that make the Biden camp nervous? No. Let's, let's rewind the tape on this a little bit. He's essentially an incumbent president getting 60% of the vote. He's having 35 to 45% of his party vote against him. Most, and these aren't general election voters. These are primary voters. So I would expect most of those voters, grudgingly, to come home to Trump, but not all. So when I ran campaigns, the more data I had, the mm. better I did. And the Biden campaign and all the battleground states can model these voters, and it helps you target Republicans and, and, and conservative-leading independents. So, no, I, d I think they're probably, and that's one of the reasons they'd love to have Haley stay in. Give us another 15 or 20 mm. states where we're learning something about the people who may be open to Biden. And the reason why that targeting is so important is because while you describe this as potentially an ugly race as we round the corner towards conventions in November, it may also be one it's pretty apathetic with people maybe sitting this one out. The Biden campaign cannot afford that. No, I mean, I think young people are going to play the most important mm -hmm. role in this race, both in terms of their support levels, their turnout levels, and how many of them flake to third parties. David, thank you so much. We're glad sure. to have you here as we look ahead to potentially November. We're not there yet. We still have the rest of this night to go. Very quick thoughts here on expectations from Nikki Haley as she gets ready to take the stage in the minute we have left. Look, I think Nikki Haley is going to go out there and play the happy warrior. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, to David's point, you look at even some of the things you talked about in your book, right, the audacity to win. Uh, there was a long stretch here. Republicans had the opportunity to put forth somebody who could go in there and have their quote unquote Obama moment. It never happened. You had DeSantis going from being ahead to being behind. You had Haley trying to be the one that rises to the top. In the end, the numbers show the Republican Party firmly ready to move forward towards the general election. MK. I mean, she earned the chance to get here, right? Mm -hmm. And she's going to make an argument that she can continue to move forward. But she's speaking ultimately to a general election audience without getting past that hurdle. Mark, very quickly. She, she's not going to talk about it, but she needs to talk to herself about why she's doing this and what her future is in Republican politics. Because every day she stays in, she's basically eliminating her career. We are going to see what she says. We are going to see how she says it. We are going to see the tone by which she says it as we are coming up on the top of the hour here. Nikki Haley expected to take the stage any minute. Our coverage continues right here on NBC News Now. This is an NBC News special. Decision 2024. The South Carolina primary. Reporting tonight, Hallie Jackson. Welcome back to our special coverage of the South Carolina presidential primary. And listen, you know the headline here, a potentially historic night for former President Trump. NBC News projecting that he has won in a landslide. We've already heard from him. He said it's been an early evening and a fantastic one. We are still waiting to hear from Nikki Haley. And I want to show you here on our big wall where her campaign is. Haley headquarters here down in RS 35. I want to have our team take that full because the room has filled up. We expect we could see her maybe any minute. Haley wants to avoid the worst loss ever, 
for a Republican primary candidate in their home state. Because remember, this is a state where she was governor for years. It is quite literally her home turf. Right now, we only have a small portion of the vote in at this point. Chuck Todd will explain it is probably the early vote. And the number we want to look at here, 19. That's the key for the margin. Anything over that, it would be an historic primary loss here in a home state. Anything under that, and maybe it gives Nikki Haley at least a little momentum to make the case that she should stay in through Super Tuesday. Big questions we have now. How is she plotting this path forward? What is the case she's making to voters now? And is she really going to stay in this race until Super Tuesday like she said she will do? Shortly after polls closed, we heard from former President Trump literally three minutes after polls closed. He didn't say the words Nikki or Haley, but he did sound a lot like a candidate who's pivoting to what's next. Now is the spirit that I have never seen. We ran two great races. But there's never been, ever, there's never been a spirit like this. And I just want to say that I have never seen the Republican Party so unified as it is right now. I want to get now to Haley headquarters where our correspondent Ali Vitali is standing by. So Ali, talk us through it. What is the expectation for the next few minutes here for the Haley campaign? Well, Allie, we have heard Nikki Haley's rationale for staying in this race over and over again. It's one of the rare instances where you see a candidate lose their home state and you don't instantly wonder if they're going to drop out the next day. Haley has already put that to rest starting this week by saying that no matter what happens on Saturday, she is going to be in this race on Sunday. Someone who might be happy about that is a new friend that I have made here, Olivia Piercy. Actually, you're from Texas, but you're here in South Carolina. You're one of the members of the Women for Nikki chapters. Talk about why you're here, and more importantly, tell me why you were crazy enough to go to Iowa in negative 40 degrees to door knock for this woman. Well, so I am 23 years old, and I am starting my career out in politics, and I'm kind of looking at this playing field now, and I, from the get-go, was always a fan of Nikki Haley. She is a uniter, not a divider, and I'm worried that if Donald Trump is our nominee, this is going to have to be my mess that my generation cleans up. And I just wanted to get involved and stay active and be active because Nikki Haley is the only person that is going to get our country back on track. And she is just a terrific human being. And I'm just blessed to be a part of this whole thing as a volunteer. You know, it strikes me that you came of political age in the Trump era. You've never known that sort of old time classic version of a Republican candidate. What was it like? I mean, back in 2020, you were able to vote at that point. I mean, you had to make a decision between Trump and Biden. Can you can you tell me what you did there? It was a tough one. I had to say it was one of those things where I was going to either stick with the establishment, go with the party, or I was going to go with what I believed in. And to be honest, it was a really tough one. And I ended up writing in some one of the candidates that was running in 2020. And it's one of those things where in 2016, if you asked me, I would have supported Donald Trump. But just after, you know, years and years of him being president, it just we needed a change. The, the party needed a change. The country needed a change. And I just was I was not prepared to vote for him. And now I'm so on Team Nikki and I'm just blessed to be a part of this whole movement, this Women for Nikki movement, and I'm just over the moon to be here and supporting her. What happens, though, if she can't get this nomination and you're faced in 2024 with the same thing you were faced with in 2020? Well, for me right now, I'm focused on the next 10 days. For me, it's about getting from South Carolina to Super Tuesday. That's my focus. So You and her both. What do you say? You and her both. Exactly. That's our focus. I mean, that's the whole campaign's focus. And we're just happy to be here, happy to be a part of this. But the focus is on tonight and the next 10 days. I wonder if I can ask you what the most important issues to you are in this campaign right now. For me, I have to say, I'm in Texas now, it has to be the border. I mean, that's what it comes down to. We we see the distress that's occurring down at the border now. And as a state, we, we need help. We need help. And it, it can't be just a state state's issue. You're also a 23-year-old woman living in Texas. And I talk about, I talk to those women, and they also talk about SB8 and the abortion restrictions that are in play there. Is that something that you think about in your home state? Definitely, of course. And I think that Nikki's answer is a good one. You know, got to give it back to the states. And, you know, that that's a, that's the a focus there, you know. And so I think that I align more with where Nikki is on the abortion stance. And I think that she has a great answer when it comes to it. And I 100% I agree with her. Thank you so much, Olivia, for chatting with us and for making your way onto this press riser. Because, Hallie, I have to tell you, it is difficult to get up here on this riser. And we are not currently able.
hill to go down to where Olivia was. So I appreciate you taking the Thank climb so up much. to talk with us. And Hallie, I'll send it back to you here as we keep waiting for Nikki Haley to take the stage. I know it's a tight squeeze for you there, girlfriend, on those risers. Thank you so much. As we are looking at the crowd behind you, we heard some cheering. We hear what sounds like some perhaps pre-programming ahead of what we expect to see in maybe the next few minutes here. And that is Nikki Haley take that stage. Former President Trump has already taken the stage. He came out real early where Garrett Hake is. You can see Nikki Haley's watch party. Garrett is over here over my other shoulder. And Garrett, looks like you are also with somebody who's a Trump supporter, yeah? That's right, Hallie. We were able to get down off the riser and into the crowd here as it's thinning out with Donald Trump speaking very early tonight. But I'm with Cindy, who's from Tiga K, North Carolina. She's a preschool teacher, teaches kids about the age of my daughter, so I know you work hard. But you got dressed up to come out here tonight. And I'm just curious, what motivates you to come out and want to be part of something like this? There was no drama to tonight. You knew Donald Trump was going to give a victory speech. Why would you want to be here? I have yet to make it to a rally, and I really needed to come. I have to see him. I got dressed up for my president. I had to. I appreciate the commitment. Now, you told me that you were not always a Donald Trump supporter. You were a Ted Cruz person in 2016. What have you seen between then and now? I mean, you also told me you didn't even consider Nikki Haley. You, By the time this race started, you were there. Yes. Why? Uh, everything I've been seeing happening to Trump and how he's coming through it even stronger and stronger, it makes me support him more because it makes me realize the cards are stacked against him in so many ways that he needs the support, and I don't believe everything that's said about him. When you talk all. about the cards stacked against him, do you mean the court cases, yes. the criminal cases, exactly. things like that? Yes. How do you how do you feel about that stuff when you see it in the news? It, it's very disheartening. It's it's I don't believe any of it um, because I see other people on the other side do a lot worse and not get anything done to them. Do not get any re retribution or anything. Nothing. If he's convicted of a crime, does that change your mind? I mean, right now these are charges. He has a presumption of innocence like anybody else in the country. But if he's convicted of a crime, does that feel more real to you? I think if he's convicted of a crime, I don't think it's real. I mean, look what happened in New York with Ar Aragon. Oh, with the, the civil wasn't, fraud he, trial. He wasn't allowed a jury trial. Uh, he wasn't allowed to bring in evidence like I just saw tonight that all the evidence that he brought into the court was just saying, oh, well, her, her cell phones are only saying that she was within a couple miles from there. Look, the reason I'm interested in this, I'll just tell you, there's a whole school of thought among Republicans that he should talk about those things that affect him less and more about the things that affect more voters like you. But what I feel like I'm hearing from you, and stop me if I'm wrong, is that part of what he's going through appeals to you as a voter. You, It makes you more likely to support him, not less. Yes, but it doesn't appeal to me. It makes me... Yeah, I feel bad. I, I feel like this is not... It's political persecution. We have J6ers that are still in prison, hundreds of them, no trial date, they can't see lawyers, they're languishing in prison, and now they're going after our former president. It just, it's not fair. The weaponized I mean, Justice Department. Yes. That connects with Very you. much so. That's Very interesting. Much. It's interesting to me because you talk about the other issues that affect you, and I don't think of that as an issue that affects a preschool teacher in a small town in South Carolina. But you know, my husband says he doesn't like politics because he's only concerned with what goes on inside our house. What goes on inside in the world, outside in the world, affects what goes on inside our house. Cindy, I so much appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. I know this is your first time doing television. You are phenomenal. I hope you enjoy the rest of the night. You got your sign. Hallie, I, I think that was so instructive, uh, you know, to talk about these are not just the kitchen table issues right. that Donald Trump has been trying to pivot to, but that his supporters really do feel that personal connection with him on the legal cases that were supposed to be, at least in the minds of some of the Republicans who ran against him in this primary, going to be his Achilles heel. Voters like Cindy, I think, are proof positive that is not the case. I love that you asked that question, Garrett, to get at the heart of that, which we have seen and heard from Trump supporters. Uh, Garrett Hake, live for us there at Trump HQ. Garrett, thank you. Speaking of all things Donald Trump, I want to go to our moderator of Meet the Press, Kristen Welker. And Kristen, I understand you're working on some new reporting on the thinking inside Trump world right now? Well, Hallie, that's right. And Garrett actually 
teed me up perfectly for that because there he's having a conversation with a staunch Trump supporter about the fact that that grievance filled message really resonates with her. We have been a team of reporters and I have been working, talking to Trump aides and allies who say, look, they want him to be focused on the general election. And in order to do that, in order to be an effective general election candidate, they want him to spend less time talking about his grievances. They know he's going to do it. He's never going to change who he is, but to spend more time in these speeches focused on the issues that matter to voters, things like the border that we've been talking about throughout the night, things like the economy, because it's those independent, those moderate voters, Hallie, who could be turned off by him talking about the four indictments against him. It's a very different audience once you get to a general election. And that's where the message from Nikki Haley tonight, Hallie, is going to be so fascinating. I wouldn't be surprised if we heard her reiterate one of her core themes, which is that in a general election, she does much better against President Joe Biden than Donald Trump does. That a vast majority of voters don't want a rematch between Biden and Trump. But again, that's the message from aides and allies. The fact that Donald Trump was a little bit more moderate in his comments tonight, I think was notable, may have been an indication that he too clearly has his eyes set on the realities that will be required of November. Now, of course, that will ebb and flow. You and I have been covering him for a long time, but it is notable, Hallie. Kristen Welker, thank you so much, friend. It's good to have your perspective on this, your analysis. I want to show you where vote stands right now. 33% of the vote, and if you're looking at these numbers going, okay, wait a second, Donald Trump, the projected winner, right now the margin, 59% to about 40%, but let me go over here to Chuck Todd, because Chuck, we should know some things when you peel back some of these layers yeah. about where these this vote count essentially is. Talk us through Well, that. very quickly, I mean, she needs to come out, because that 40% number, we may be at her high water. Mark, and here's why. Because let me tell you, right, we have an expected vote here. Before today, we expected about 850,000. Our updated turnout estimate is much is about 100,000 lower than that now. We think it's going to be somewhere in the 750 range. Um, not good, you know, lower, higher turnout would have been better for Haley here. But if you look mo right now, two thirds of this total vote that we've counted is early vote, mm. either early in person or absentee vote. And she is doing about 10 points better in the early vote. I'll give you an example of one Please. county um, just to show folks uh, real quick here. It happens, oop, didn't mean to do that one. That happens every once and, in a while. And the it happens to be your home county here. Okay. Okay. Bamber, we got all the vote in. Overall, Trump won this county, as you can see here, um, 6138. Uh, Overall, uh, election day vote, he gets he got 64%. Mm. Early and in-person vote, he only got 56. So you could see this is where her number right now is mostly her strongest numbers. It's the people that voted early. It's the people that voted by mail. That what she is doing better among those voters. Election day voters, because we know Donald Trump doesn't trust vote by mail. That's right. He doesn't want his voters to do that. Election day vote, we only think we've got, accounted about 10% of today's voters, which is why that number is likely to get over 60. And so your point is that if Nikki Haley wants to come out and give a I'm speech that is defiant, that gives a speech that says, I'm staying in this through Super Tuesday and beyond, this is the moment where she would be she's doing She's in the that. 40s still in this vote while everybody's watching. And 40s, we talked about this, 40s to me was something that you felt like, okay, you're not winning, but it's not like this is a blowout, right? You don't have half the party, but it, you know, it's more than a third of the party. The, the more in the 30s it is, I think the harder it is for her to make her rationale. And that's what the question is as we come back over here to our corner wall area, if you will, as we pass our vote board here. We're going to be keeping an eye on that. But when you look at Nikki Haley's campaign, her Haley headquarters here, you see people cheering, people getting ready. Perhaps it seems like for her to come out, the question is, what is she going to say? How is she going to say it? And where do these numbers end up? We'll be right back with more of our special coverage of the South Carolina primary right here on NBC News Now.
Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. News lives in the now. The horrors of the war on full display on both sides of the Israel-Gaza border. Protesters are on the streets here. Most of the time, the Iron Dome works, but a few get through. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Fire has grown uh, leaps and bounds. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Um, pretty, pretty bad. We are back with our special coverage of the South Carolina primary, and we are on the air because we are waiting for what is about to go down in this room, whatever is about to happen. When the former South Carolina governor, Nikki Haley, comes out and speaks to her crowd of supporters here after projected, being projected to lose her home state in potentially a landslide. The key number, what is the margin of her defeat? And what will her tone be? She has said now for weeks that she is insistent she will stay in this race through Super Tuesday, which is March 5th. Given the reality at hand, given the reality of the numbers, does she hold to that strategy? Does she shift or pivot? I want to bring back our political pros with us here. Joseph Pinion, Republican strategist and former New York Senate candidate. Columnist Mary Catherine Hamm, host of the podcast Getting Hammered. And Mark Lauder, former director of strategic communications for the former president's 2020 campaign. So, MK, let me start with you here because Nikki Haley has long made the case that she wants to stay in this race to give Republicans who are disillusioned with former President Trump an option an alternative. How long can that path realistically last for her here? Well, there's only so long that the goodwill and the money can hold out, right? You have to sort of allow for that. Now, there might be some there. She has been able to raise money. Um, you, you make a very good point that that money doesn't go to other people when it's going to her. I would also just point out in this early, these early voting numbers, the fact that they are good for her, a little bit of a flashing warning sign for Trump as he's looking forward to a general election, which is that uh, he can't be telling people not to early vote mm. uh, if he wants to win a general election. This is It makes sense that Nikki Haley's voters would be more willing to do that because Trump has been telling his voters that's a bad idea. That is not the way to win a general election. There's also so much about nights like these that have to do with the optics, whether you like it or not, and about the messages that you send. And I think back to New Hampshire, a state where Nikki Haley did the best that she has done, presumably so far in this campaign, although we obviously need to see what the numbers are are from tonight. She came out early. That seemed to really annoy former President Trump in that speech, right? <laughs> Here we are now, an hour and 20 minutes past polls close in a state, in her own state, and we still haven't heard from her, Mark. No, it's, it's definitely something's going on behind the scenes. They're doing something with that speech. But You I mean, think? That, that's what you would think? Uh, that's that what I would thought, assume, yeah. because, I mean, the outcome has not been in question. I don't think even Nikki Haley's people could have convinced her that she had some sort of chance of winning this thing. So you knew what you were going to basically be saying. The question's going to be, you know, Donald Trump maximized his viewership, maximized when people were interested. 40 seconds after the polls close, it's called. He's out two minutes later. You know, maximum eyeballs moving forward. She's now, the, the clock is dwindling on her. And why, why is that for an outcome we all knew was happening? I mean, I think you look at primaries where somebody has continued to make the case even after traditional logic says that they're not going to win. You think of somebody like Jesse Jackson when he ran for president. You also think of somebody like Bernie Sanders running against Hillary Clinton. They were winning states. They could make the mm. case that they had both the resources but also a pathway, no matter how slim it was. But she has said all along, I think in a lot of it, we saw it in New Hampshire, we saw it, um, you know, we're seeing it here tonight, that a loss is still a win. In, a, in some way. A her. loss is only a win in presidential primary politics when those losses come with delegates. And apparently, she has to figure out how she's going to make the case because I think it was you talked about earlier on this panel. Just because something catastrophic might happen to the campaign of President Trump does not mean that all of those delegates are going to turn their lonely eyes to Nikki Haley. Uh, we end up having a brokered convention, and I would bet a decent amount of money that it's unlikely she would walk out of that process as a nominee just because she's the one to be able to say I've been vetted and I've been in there so it's gonna be interesting to see what she says on that stage uh, but ultimately I think there are less and less people believing that the former ambassador even believes the words coming out of her own well, what, whatever happens tonight the, the party has a problem because in these numbers it's like six of ten Republicans in the primary are for who is the presumptive nominee on the other side it's nine of ten for Biden right so even though enthusiasm is low for him you do have a consolidation problem that well, he's going to need to I work on proactively. I wouldn't be concerned about that, though, because at least a third of that vote is Democrats and independents coming over to, to play in, in our primary. Not in those numbers. Those numbers were much lower. Um, 
I, I, there are people he needs to convince. There are that people he needs that he will to have to convince. Way. Well, I'll just say this. I, I think that there are two parties that have both tried their best to circle the wagons around their presumptive nominee. I would actually make the argument Democrats have done a much better job. They canceled all the debates. Uh, the, the fact that you would think that Vivek was going to go out there and do as well as he did in Iowa without the benefit mm. of having access to media, without the benefit of being able to get on TV and debate in front of three and four and five million people, uh, it would be unlikely. So I think that is the stark difference if you're looking at the numbers on the left and the numbers on the right. The numbers on the right appear to be giving more deference to alternatives because of the fact that there was a process, whether President Trump participated or not, where they were actually able to get face time with potential voters and make their case for why they should be a campaign, uh, should be a candidate for President of the United States. For those wondering, it's not us putting that rock and guitar solo behind our <laughs> political prose comments. That's Queen playing we from the room. It. You sure do. We're Nikki Haley's headquarters is where we expect to see her at some point. I want to bring in Dave Wasserman now, senior editor and elections analyst of the nonpartisan Cook Political Report. So, Dave, um, here we are now talking about Nikki Haley's path. And for the, the political geeks among us, myself included, one of the things we always look for is your I've seen enough tw tweets and posts. The, pretty early for you to declare that tonight. I'm not even bothering with, with those three words because, look, uh, this has not been a competitive race. In retrospect, there never really was a, a, lane, a viable lane for a candidate other than Trump in these primaries. But look, Nikki Haley is an accountant and she knows how many delegates are at stake on Super Tuesday. And my guess is that she stays in through then and accumulates delegates because she does have, you know, on average, a 20 percent market share. Most states are winner take all either by state or district. So that kind of cuts off her, her path to winning significant numbers of delegates, but some are proportional. And she knows that Donald Trump, that there's still four months to, more than four months to go before the Republican convention. We're talking about someone who is gonna be 78 by that time. And you know, if, if there is something that, uh, that opens up uh, this nomination before then, she'll have more delegates than anyone else. In some ways, Dave, I wonder if she's not looking to run the Romney map, if you will, despite the fact that this is no, no longer Mitt Romney's party. That's right. And if you look at the results map from South Carolina tonight, what's striking, her pattern of support is almost precisely what Marco Rubio's pattern was in 2016, almost precisely what Mitt Romney's was against Newt Gingrich back in 2012. It's Charleston County. It's Buford. It's Richland County, which uh, obviously is Columbia. And so she is, is, you know, of these kind of more upscale suburban Republicans, and there's still remnants of that in the Republican Party. You saw her win one county in Iowa. You saw her do well in highly college educated towns in New Hampshire. But across the board, the Republican Party has been remade in Trump's image. And she's competing for uh, support in a, in a party that has really passed her and others of her kind by. Dave Wasserman, uh, we're so glad to have you and your analysis, as always, right here on NBC News Now for our special coverage of the South Carolina primary. More to come as you are watching on the other side of your screen, that dance party in front of the stage, but behind the scenes, some question marks about what's happening with the Haley campaign and what she may say when she takes the microphone at some point, presumably tonight. We'll be right back.
lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand. And officials say an entire town is cut off. This close to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Reporting over the skies of Lahaina. Every weeknight, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We are back with our special coverage of the South Carolina primary and that live shot you're seeing right now on your screens. That is where we are waiting to see Nikki Haley take the stage after she is projected to lose her home state with former President Donald Trump projected to win in a landslide. I want to bring in Republican Congressman William Timmons from South Carolina. Congressman, thank you for being on and preemptive apologies in case I need to interrupt you if Nikki Haley does begin to speak here. What, one of the things that we still don't know tonight beyond what Nikki Haley will say is the margin of victory for former President Trump. What to you does he need to make this what he wants, a decisive win that he sees as something uh, that puts him on the path towards the general election? Well, look, you've got a third of the vote reporting, and she's down 60-40. She could lose 65-35. Um, this is the message she needs to end her campaign and to endorse the president. Our country is in turmoil. We are on the wrong track, and we need Donald Trump to take Joe Biden on in the November election and get our country back on track. She needs to end her campaign. Are there warning signs in what we've seen in some of the exit polls when it comes to enthusiasm here, Congressman, in your view? The concern that perhaps, I'm not talking about in a primary, but if you're going to bring up a general, that in a general election, the voters that a, the former president would need to win, those suburban women, for example, in some of those collar counties, that they will not show up? You know, I think the VP can address a lot of that, but at the end of the day, seven million people cross the southern border illegally. You have... Um, uh, millions of Americans that have tried to save to buy a home and they're not able to buy a home because interest rates have more than doubled. Uh, look, energy prices are up, groceries are up. The, the, the country is in the, on the wrong okay. track. We got to get back on track. Congressman Timmons, thank you very much. Uh, and again, apologies for interrupting you, but Nikki Haley is taking the stage. We are going to listen in to what the former South Carolina governor has to say about this projected loss on her home turf in the state where she served for years. Let's listen in. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Y'all are a rowdy bunch. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I want to start off obviously thanking my family. I am so incredibly blessed. I was able to speak with Michael this morning. Um, I just, his support has been amazing. The kids have really stepped up, sometimes too much, but they have stepped up in a way that has made me so, so proud. I am blessed because I had the ability to actually um, go vote today with my mom. Yeah. You know, and there's something very special with the fact that she was a lawyer in India and she was named one of the first female judges. And because of the times, she was never able to sit on the bench. But the fact that she could go with me and cast her ballot for her daughter as president of the United States was an amazing... who taught me strength and grace. I want to thank Michael's parents who have been unbelievably supportive through all of this. And I want to thank my brothers and my sister and their families for always supporting us every step of the way. Thank you. I feel blessed tonight. I've felt blessed through this entire journey. Even when it's been tough. I haven't lost sight of that. I've felt God's strength and grace every step of the way. I 
I'm blessed to have served the state that raised me. And I look forward to continuing to be blessed to serve the state that raised me, whether it's going and voting with my mom or whether it is um, being with our family. We're very grateful for the good people of South Carolina. Thank you. And it's a blessing to know that across our sweet state, everyone wants to bring back the America we know and love. That's the underlying message of what happened today. I want to congratulate Donald Trump on his victory. And I want to thank the people of South Carolina for using the power of your voice. No matter the results, I love the people of our state. we accomplished together and I love how we united during our worst challenges and tragedies. Yes. Yes. I've always seen our state as a family. Woo. Families are honest with each other. They say the hard truths. That's what I've done this entire campaign. Yes. And that's what I'll do now. Yes. What I saw today was South Carolina's frustration with our country's direction. I've seen that same frustration nationwide. I share it. I feel it to my core. I couldn't be more worried about America. It seems like our country is falling apart. But here's the thing. America will come apart if we make the wrong choices. This has never been about me or my political future. We need to beat Joe Biden in November. I don't believe Donald Trump can beat Joe Biden. Nearly every day, Trump drives people away including with his comments just yesterday. Today in South Carolina, we're getting around 40% of the vote. That, that's, about what, that's about what we got in New Hampshire, too. I'm going to count it. I know 40% is not 50%. But I also know 40% is not some tiny group. huge numbers of voters in our Republican primaries who are saying they want an alternative. Yeah. I said earlier this week that no matter what happens in South Carolina, I would continue to run for president. Yeah. I'm a woman of my word. Yeah. giving up this fight when a majority of Americans disapprove of both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. <laughs> South Carolina has spoken. We're the fourth state to do so. In the next 10 days, another 21 states and territories will speak. They have the right to a real choice. Not a Soviet-style election with only one candidate. And I have 
have a duty to give them that choice. We can't afford four more years of Biden's failures or Trump's lack of focus. We're at 34 trillion in debt and counting. Not even a third of our eighth graders are proficient in reading. Families can't afford groceries. Nine million illegals have come to our border with enough fentanyl to kill every single American. And beyond our borders, the world is on fire. War is spreading further every day. If we aren't strong, those wars will draw America further in. And it's not just about policies. We won't get out of our downward spiral if we keep obsessing over the past. Does, does anyone seriously think Joe Biden or Donald Trump will unite our country to solve our problems? One of them calls his fellow Americans fascists. The other calls his fellow Americans vermin. They aren't fighting for our country's future. They're demanding we fight each other. The younger generation, my children's generation, knows it better than anyone. They deserve better. They deserve leadership. And so I will keep fighting for them and for you and for all of America. From the start of this campaign, I have made clear that I'm running for president to save America. to remind us what it means to be an American. In the America I know and love, we believe in each other. And we believe in America's inherent goodness. Now is the time to renew that belief. Now is the time to remember who we are. We're citizens of the greatest country in human history. now more than ever before. I'm grateful to South Carolina. I always have been and I always will be. And I'm grateful that today is not the end of our story. We're headed to Michigan tomorrow. And we're headed to the Super Tuesday states throughout all of next week. We'll keep fighting for America and we won't rest until America wins. I want to give a few thank yous because we have had some people who've really, there have been too many to thank. But I really have to single out Congressman Ralph Norman. Yeah. Ralph has had pressure on him from every side that he needed to not. And there you have it from former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, current Republican presidential primary candidate Nikki Haley, declaring she will stay in this race, saying that today is not the end of her story, pledging to fight on to Michigan and to the Super Tuesday states that go to the polls on March 5th. I want to bring back in our political pros now. Joseph Pinion, Republican strategist and former New York Senate candidate. Columnist Mary Catherine Hamm, host of the podcast Getting Hammered. And Mark Lauder, former director of strategic communications for Donald Trump's 2020 campaign. There was a, a little bit of misdirection maybe in the beginning there where Nikki Haley came out 
perhaps looking a little glum, talking about hard truths. Turned out the hard truth she wanted to deliver to the party was that Donald Trump, in, in the argument she is making, is not equipped to win a general election against Joe Biden. It felt a bit like a tale of two speeches, as if one person in the office decided to write a speech in case she got out, the other person decided to write a speech about the fight goes on to Super Tuesday. In the end, they couldn't decide, so they cut them in half and stitched them together. Ultimately, what I heard didn't sound like somebody running for the Republican nomination for president. It sounded like somebody uh, who was running for some type of quasi third party bid, uh, because it wasn't really trying to make the case, at least to me effectively, that she was going to somehow be able to find a way to win. The job of, of, of politics is to win. The job of elected officials is to govern. But right now, she cannot really truly articulate a pathway towards winning a Republican primary. And I think ultimately, it's going to grind on so many Republican voters. The only choice he might have left is that third party way. Of course, she makes the point, and she knows that people like you, former President Trump supporters, right, people who back the former president, that's not who she's necessarily going after. She's going after the Republican. Republicans who want a choice. And she said there in that speech, she knows 40% is not 50%. The, the reality is that she can only fight for them if she either wins enough delegates to become the nominee or if she somehow finds a way to break the laws of political physics and run a third party campaign and be victorious in doing so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like the target demo for this pitch, right? I'm, oh, normie mom Republican. She's saying normal things. She's not obsessed with the past. Uh, she, this is nice. I'm enjoying this, right? But I can also look at the numbers. And I think the, the biggest issue with her pitch is when you say Trump can't win, if you look at these Emerson polls from battleground states and you see him winning against Biden, um, even though I don't think those numbers are certain and they may not pan out, it's very hard to get people out of the Trump camp mm. and say, no, take a chance on me when it's not clear that he couldn't win. And that was her strongest argument. Right. No, I, you, you're, you're exactly right. The polls do show that he that he is winning right now in a head to head matchup. And I get it that that Nikki likes to say, well, I would beat Joe Biden by even more. But that's like saying that, you know, on in preseason, my team's going to win the Super Bowl. You forgot to play the season. You didn't win a game. You didn't make the playoffs. You haven't won a playoff game. You don't get to play in the Super Bowl if you don't win. There, there are plenty of Jets fans right now thinking, if only we had Aaron Rodgers, we would be in the Super Bowl. Well, the reality was the season started, uh, his ankle exploded, and that is not the team that you actually currently have. And so I think that becomes the issue with Nikki Haley. It's not that people dislike her. It's not that she doesn't have the capacity to beat Joe Biden. It's the fact that the way the structure is set up, she has not thread the needle to be the Republican nominee. And day by day, not only is she alienating Republican voters, she in many ways is weakening Republicans up and down the ballot because as I said from the beginning, you need money to win. Hmm. And Republicans are burning through billions of dollars through this primary yeah, process. Pay that legal fund. Yeah. Well, look, it, there are a lot of things that have to get paid for, namely ads for the candidates that actually can win those swing districts. Well, I did see, and, you I know, did see on social media that Nikki Haley spent $16.5 million in her home state of South Carolina and Donald Trump spent $1.3 million in, the home, in, in South Carolina. Well, her campaign has said all along consistently they believe they have the resources to go the distance that she is making clear tonight in that speech you just watched live right here on NBC News Now that she made clear she will go, Chuck. I'll tell you, I'm having, it is interesting the, the sort of the conundrum she has found herself in. You know, in 2000, at this point in time, South Carolina primary, George W. Bush wins by double div digits over a John McCain. 17 lifetimes ago. I'm aware of that. <laughs> and yet John McCain ends up going to Super Tuesday. He gets out eventually. But McCain is actually more popular at the time than either Al Gore or George W. Bush was. But the problem for McCain was he wasn't popular with Democratic voters. He wasn't popular with the uh, enough Republican voters. He was popular with a bunch of voters who don't have a way to get you on the ballot. And I would say that she was flirting with a no labels bid based on those the remarks, third, no. except there's too many sore loser laws. She's actually filed for too many primaries. Right. She couldn't realistically do it. But I want to back up something that MK said. We asked, our exit pollsters asked, if Trump is nominated, how likely is he to beat Biden? 82%, 82% of South Carolina Republican voters told us, oh boy, they think Trump's win. And Nikki Haley, they also think it was a majority, but it was under 60, mm. just 59%. Look, I had talked to plenty of e even Trump strategists who have said to me, if Trump were losing to Biden in these general election polls, this primary would have gone a lot differently. The single most important thing going for Trump is just like what happened in 2016, right? Everybody knew he wasn't the strongest candidate against Hillary, but he also polled well against her. Well, and that's the thing, he's not as strong, but he also 
He's also beating him right now. Whether they're, whether they're believable polls in the spring, we'll see. Well, that teases up well for David Pluff, who's joining us again, former Obama campaign manager, NBC News political analyst, as we are seeing now. And you see it on screen, Nikki Haley there in the room, shaking hands, giving hugs, continuing now to travel, as she says, to Michigan and then to those Super Tuesday states, even as the former president is looking ahead to what Chuck was just talking about and a potential matchup now with President Biden. Well, I think Donald Trump signals that he's, he's done with the primary, and he should be. He'll ignore her. I wouldn't set foot in another primary state that's not a battleground state. We'll see if he follows that. Mm. Um, and the geriatric cage matches on. Um, but again, I think if you look at the three primaries, you know, 35, 40 percent of Republican primary voters, and there's a big difference between general election only voters and primary voters, are choosing another candidate. And about a third of them are saying they're going to have huge problems if Trump gets convicted. We don't know if he will. So from a st standpoint of the general election where you've, you know, depending on a third party vote, you're going to need anywhere from 47 to 50 percent of the vote to win electoral college votes. And I think what Joe Biden's campaign has is more Republicans than he even had in 20, mm. when he had a lot of them, that he could target. Because, you know, you, to win these states, it's a, it's a complicated puzzle. You're grabbing some independents, some moderates, some right of center, depends trying to win the state, turnout game. Right. Where, right, right. And so I, if you think about suburban voters in Maricopa County in Arizona, you're thinking about suburban voters outside of Detroit. You're thinking about all those big suburban voters outside of Atlanta, where Biden did really well in 20. I think he's got the chance to do even better this time based on the results of this. Now, he's not as strong a candidate because people have concerns about age. Both of these candidates are deeply flawed. Uh, and so that's what's going to make this, I think, a fascinating election, uh, is they really, neither of them have a lot of margin for error. And I wouldn't pay too much attention to polls right now. I think it helps Trump that polls You're talking about winning. battleground polls for a general. Yeah, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, and listen, a lot of these polls will show 44, 42. I don't really care about 44, 42. I want to know what's the other 14% going to do. Hmm. And that's what sometimes I think we mistake polls. We go to the head-to-head, -head, but 100% of the vote gets allocated, not 86%. There's also, can we just be real here for a second, too? If you're, t tonight, I love, this is fascinating to me as somebody who covers politics, as my, part of my life's yeah. work, to you, to the people that we have assembled here on set, the vast majority of Americans just aren't tuning in to the degree that uh, political junkies are tuning into right now, right? And that is something that you hear, frankly, from a lot of the campaigns campaigns, right, that folks are simply not engaging. I hear it from sources in the Biden camp all the time when you look at these poll numbers when they come out, that people are simply not engaging in general election discussion, thought, et cetera, in a serious way, and that that won't happen likely until at least the conventions, if not till after Labor Day. Particularly with younger voters. And I think both candidates and their campaigns have to know that you're going to, whoever wins is going to win this by getting more people holding their nose mm. and voting for them. That's just the reality. This is a muddy track. Uh, th and, and whoever going to win is going to win it ugly. And you're going to win, there's the double haters we talk about from a swing voter standpoint. But even on the turnout game, there's going to be both Biden and Trump have a lot of people in their party not thrilled that they're going to be the nominee. And the person who's the best job getting people over that, because I think a lot of the core messaging here, and I think Trump will struggle with this a little bit because he has a hard time admitting any weakness, is to say, listen, I know a lot of you might not be psyched about this. Like, I hope Biden does that with young voters. Mm. I know I wouldn't be your top pick. I get it. But this is the choice. Uh, so I think there's going to have to be a lot of dexterity here um, to kind of piece together the, the numbers you need to win these battleground states. Stand by for a second. I want to bring in Claire McCaskill, former Democratic senator from Missouri and an NBC News political analyst, and Frank Lutz, who's been a political strategist and pollster for Republicans, also the author of Words That Work. It is good to have you both. Frank, let me go to you first here. And what you make of the speech we just heard from Nikki Haley tonight, insisting she is going to stay in this race and fight. She's clearly defiant. She's clearly not watching what the voters have to say. And I agree with David. And we just finished a survey for the National Governors Association on the anger and divisions and the polarization and toxicity of the American electorate. And what tonight shows, what every night has shown, is that we're going to have the most negative, vicious, personal, inhuman campaign that we've experienced in decades. And I feel very sorry for the voters who've had enough of this already because this has only just begun. I give Governor uh, Haley credit for her perseverance. But let's face it, it's Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. I agree with David Plouffe completely. And what scares me the most is that the only way to win those last 14% that David speaks of is going to be a scorcher policy 
to a country mm. that is already saying enough. Senator McCaskill, let me bring you in on this. Do you believe that it is scorched earth or bust here for the Biden campaign moving forward? Well, there's no doubt this is going to be a campaign all about contrast, hmm. and it has to be. As, as David has said eloquently and as Frank referenced, uh, this is a hold-your-nose election. Like it or not, it's a hold-your-nose election and pick the lesser of two evils for most Americans. Now, I think Biden can work hard to take some of that away, but it is what it is. I will say this about Nikki Haley's speech tonight in that room tonight. This is the first time I have seen a Republican on the national stage be try to be aspirational mm. and uplifting and unifying. Uh, she really took a page out of the Obama playbook. I'm not trying to compare her to Barack Obama. She is not Barack Obama. But she did hit that note that I think many swing voters want to hear, and that is can't we all get back to what's good about America and celebrating America instead of trashing America, which Donald Trump does every single day? His message is negative. It's all grievance, a lot of lies. And I thought that one of the notable lines of her speech tonight is, I'm a woman of my word. Mm. And by the way, there was no booing in her room when various people were introduced. Um, it is a different atmosphere. And I think she will continue to get a measurable amount of votes. And then the question for Joe Biden is, how many of those can he grab for the general? Frank, let me bring you back in because a couple of folks here in the room have brought up the specter of what the landscape looks like, and the senator did as well, what the landscape looks like come November here with Donald Trump, Joe Biden, if that is what the matchup ultimately turns out to be. When you look at some of these numbers from Quinnipiac, from Marquette, from NBC News, how much do you see them? How much wiggle room is there between now, not even March, come November when people are getting out and voting? Well, the problem is... 88% have decided who they're voting for. And I don't even believe that. I think that's too low. I think you only have maybe 5% that could actually change their minds between now and election day. And it's only a dozen states that are really up for grabs. So you're looking at 1% of America. We're going to spend literally billions of dollars in negative advertising and divisive polarizing politics for 1% of America. You know what? God help us. We're already at a breaking point. We're already brittle. We're already tearing each other apart. In the polling that we did for the governors, we found that almost half of Americans have written somebody out of their lives because of this negativity and this divisiveness. And you're going to have Donald Trump and Joe Biden just ripping the bark off each other. This country can't take any more of that kind of politics. Yes, I know we always lift ourselves up. But I'm really afraid of the consequences of the next eight months. Senator, quickly to you here in the minute we have left or so, what does the Biden camp need to be doing now that it's not already doing in your view? Well, first of all, in my view, this isn't about both candidates ripping the bark off. This is about Donald Trump busting every norm that a president has had in this country about respect for the truth, about respect for the office, about respect for the institutions, about the rule of law, about the peaceful transfer of power. So I think Joe Biden has to continue to point out this isn't about two older white men. This is about the future of this country and whether or not it really is going to be taken over by somebody who's going to surround himself with people that do not respect the things I just listed. Senator Claire McCaskill, Frank Lutz, thanks to both of you very much. I want to get to Ali Vitali now, who is live for us at Haley headquarters, speaking with some of her supporters after those remarks that Haley just delivered, talking about delivering hard truths and insisting she is in this race for at least days to come. That's exactly right, Hallie. And look, it's not surprising if you've been listening to Nikki Haley over the last few weeks. She's been clear that whatever happened tonight, she'd wake up on Sunday and still be a presidential candidate, and that she was taking this race through Super Tuesday. And look, her supporters in this room, including Brittany Martinez, who ironically I know from Capitol Hill, but who's here in South Carolina. It's so nice to see you again. But talk to me about knowing the Republican Party as you do. 
hearing a speech like that, while you know that a lot of people are basically foot tapping her out the door because of how tough her path is. Well, you know what? I think she hit the nail on the head today. We're at about 40%. That's nothing to laugh about. That's a big chunk of the Republican Party that's dissatisfied with the trajectory. We need new leadership. I think Nikki's going to bring that. That's why I was in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. I'm proud to support her. Braving negative 40 degree yes. temperatures. This weather I've ever been in. Yeah, that's not a joke, I gotta say. Hallie, I'll send it back to you as we wrap up here at the Nikki Haley event. Ali Vitali doing yeoman's work tonight, and it sounds like you are going to be on the road, friend, for at least uh, a few days longer, perhaps all the way past Super Tuesday. Ali, thank you very much. <laughs> Mark Lauder, let me go to you, only because you worked for the former president back during his last campaign. If you were, you know, you're in the orbit more broadly now, what would you be telling him? What are you looking for moving forward here from him? Only focus on Joe Biden. The one thing you did not have in 2020 that you have right now is Joe Biden has a record. The American people don't like it. He's negative disapproval, double digits, every single major issue that matters to the American people. You keep running on policy, you win. Do you want to hear him say the words Nikki Haley anytime between now and March 5th? Thanking her for her endorsement after she leaves. Joe, how about you? Look, President Trump has to focus on the issues. I remind that old quote from uh, Van Jones's book, Beyond the Messy Truth, Data Don't Vote. Uh, look, data is not going to tell us much, but the data does tell us that uh, Nikki Haley's campaign, whether she wants to accept it or not, is done. And moving forward, uh, you have to look at the very real reality that most Americans do not take kindly to people being found guilty of crime. So you're going to have to run all those polls over again um, if President Trump does find himself on the guilty side of one of those verdicts. And MK for you. Uh, I mean, Trump needs to keep a lid on his id. It's not something he's ever been good at. Um, he has to talk about things that other people care about and not just what he cares about. And those are challenges for him. He does have a record that people might consider next to Biden's and go, mm, maybe it's slightly less terrible. But he's got to make that pitch. Thank you all for being with us. And thank you all for watching as that wraps up for us this historic night for the South Carolina Republican primary. A big win for Donald Trump, a landslide victory, and a defiant Nikki Haley insisting she will stay in this race. Tune in tomorrow morning. Meet the press with Kristen Welker. We're going to have more analysis of this race and where it goes next on your local NBC News station. She'll have California's Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom on the show as well. This has been our NBC News Now special coverage. It's good to be with you. I'm Hallie Jackson in New York. For all of us, have a great night. This is an NBC News special, Decision 2024, The Summer.